All right, so welcome everybody to today's session. This is the third Waterloo session. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, there's a couple of things before we begin the session today. Uh, number one, uh, there is a, a preliminary uh, YouTube playlist with uh, the talk so far, including the, I pasted it on the, on the chat, but uh, Thales, uh, Rick and I, we will send an email later today uh, to everybody registered. This contains both uh, the Australian sessions that we have and the, all the Waterloo sessions. And uh, again, if uh, anybody uh, has any problems with uh, recording, please let us know. Otherwise, we are going to assume that uh, you give consent to the recording. Uh, another, another item is uh, remember that today we have a Waterloo session, but there is no Australian session today. Today is a break day for Australia, so there will be only this session today. All right, that said, uh, please uh, remember that for uh, we're going to have the talks today and remember that to ask a question, you uh, will have to use the raise hand feature uh, on Zoom and uh, that there will be uh, the if depending on the, the speaker, the questions may be taken during the talk, but preferably uh, wait until the end of the talk. And uh, without uh, uh, further ado, let's begin with the session today. It is my pleasure today to introduce uh, Chris Fuster at the University of York from the UK. And he's going to tell us, Chris, can you share a screen for everybody? Yes, certainly. Perfect. Uh, Chris, it's, a, it's really a pleasure to, uh, Chris is, uh, is a very, um, is a very sought after in the RTI community, above all those of us who care about the measurements in quantum field theory. So it's really, really nice to have him here talk, and he's going to talk about local measurements of quantum field in curved space times. Chris, uh, the floor is yours whenever you want. Thank you very much. Well, thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, as Eduardo says, I'm going to talk about local measurements of quantum fields in curved space time. And this is based on work uh, with Rainer Fesch in the first instance and also with uh, my colleague Henning Bostelman and our student Maximilian, who will be speaking later in this session, and some work in progress with Ian Job as well. So this starts really with uh, the recognition that there is a gap in the literature. Um, we all know that measurement theory in quantum mechanics has a very long and sometimes controversial history. Um, on the other hand, we do know that when push comes to shove and we have to go and talk to our students, we're always able to give them some simple rules to work with. And uh, another thing you may or may not know is that the measurement chain is well analyzed in uh, an area called quantum measurement theory. So that's for quantum mechanics. When you go to your quantum field theory class, think change. Instead of the big emphasis on measurement theory and simple rules, people simply stop talking about measurement, it seems. The lecture courses, the textbooks don't say very much about it, and uh, even when you go to the quantum measurement theory literature, very little is said about quantum fields. Now, um, one group of people you might have thought would have sorted this out long ago, and that's the community working on algebraic quantum field theory, because the whole idea is that you base everything on local observables. And when you picture there, however, you discover that um, although everything's about local observables, there's almost nothing about how local observables are actually measured. So there is a gap in the literature. And uh, we're not the first people to notice that, of course. Uh, a long time ago, Raphael Sorkin pointed out that there was a bit of a gap and pointed out also that you could try to uh, extend the rules of quantum mechanics to quantum field theory. And then he discovered that there are some potential pitfalls that hit you straight away. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Sorkin's impossible measurements and also later on how we can uh, resolve that question. So here is Sorkin's setup. Uh, he considered three uh, obser observation regions, A, B, and C, so that uh, the causal future of A intersects B and the causal future of B intersects C, but A and C are space-like separated. And uh, what he argued was that if you uh, extend the rules of quantum mechanics in a way that he uh, wrote down to quantum field theory, then you can convince yourself that a non-selective measurement made of observable B 
allows C, an observer in region C, to determine whether or not A, Alice, if you like, has made a measurement or not. And that would seem to be a form of superluminal communication. So Sorkin argued, um, in that case, the measurement B must not be possible because we don't believe that superluminal communication is allowed. But then that raises the question, well, which are the impossible measurements? If we, uh, we agree that some measurements of local observables are not possible, uh, then which are the ones that are possible and which are not? Um, I should point out here that it's important uh, for this whole scenario to work that B has a space-time extension. If we were able to measure at points, you wouldn't have this problem. But in fact, it's the uncertainty principle that really tells us you can't expect to measure at an exact point. Uh, and so a realistic measurement will have space-time extension. So Sorkin's conclusion from all of this was that it becomes a priori unclear in quantum field theory which observables can be measured consistently with causality and which ones can't. And that moreover, this deprives quantum field theory of a definite measurement theory. And you just have to go through case by case. And some people have gone through case by case. And one example of that is the paper uh, I've mentioned here. So um, I mentioned this in the first instance to show that there are pitfalls awaiting you if you try to extend the rules of quantum mechanics to quantum field theory. So what Rainer Fersch and I set out to do was instead of trying to write down the rules um, out of thin air, as it were, we wanted to be a bit more systematic and try to model the measurement process and see what this told us about things. So the basic setup that we uh, discuss is that we have two quantum field theories, one of which we'll call the system and the other we'll call the probe. And we couple them together in a compact region of space time. And this is really a proxy for a complicated experimental design. If you're wondering, by the way, how can you possibly go around uh, changing the laws of physics uh, and coupling one quantum field theory to another, um, let me just give you a sort of cartoon example with a possible interaction Lagrangian between four fields. If you use two of them as sort of auxiliary fields, um, then you can see that psi one and psi two are both switched on, as it were, in this compact region. And then that gives you, as it were, a tunable coupling between phi one and phi two. So that would be a sort of way, a cartoon of how one can couple two quantum field theories together in a uh, compact region of space time. So the idea is we will uh, try to prepare the system and the probe independently at early times. They get coupled together, some compact region K. And then at some point, we try to measure the probe. Now, we want to then interpret all of that in terms of the system by itself. We would like to uh, tell ourselves a story in which what happened was that we prepared the system, we made a measurement of the system, a system observable, and then perhaps at the end of the day, there was an updated state coming out of all of this. So this is the story we would like to tell ourselves uh, as a result of what actually happened in the laboratory over there. To get this distinction of language clear, because what happens in the laboratory is to do with the coupled system. That's where measurements actually occur. But the description that we tell ourselves um, is about a fictitious uncoupled system where we can measure the probe or we can prepare the system and probe independently. So keep this shift of language in mind. Something you might worry about here is a possible circularity because I said that I was trying to understand measurement and I have explained this uh, or will explain it in terms of measurement of a probe. So how does the measurement occur? Or if you want to be um, a little bit highfalutin about it, uh, quis metiotur ipsos mensores, who measures the measurers? And my hypothesis for getting around this is really to observe that, well, we believe that measurements do actually occur in the real world. Someone somewhere knows how to measure something. So I will take that as a working hypothesis uh, that measurement is at some level 
to be regarded as understood. What I want to understand is the chain. So if probes can be measured, what can that tell us about system observables? That's the game here. So here's the idea in outline. We use algebraic quantum field theory, um, but I think I can be reasonably schematic about things here without going into huge amounts of detail. Um, each the, the system and the probe are both described by quantum field theories, A for the system and B for the probe, and we'll work on any general globally hyperbolic space-time, capital M. And when I write, write A of M, I mean the algebra of system observables on space-time M. And if I write A M semicolon N, I mean the of those observables that can be localized within N. They are localizable within N. Now, what we're going to compare is two things. One, the uncoupled combination of the system and the probe, and that's going to be described just by a tensor product. So the local observables for our uncoupled combination is the tensor product of the uncoupled observable of the system observables localizable in N with the probe observables localizable in N. So that's one thing. On the other hand, we will consider a coupled combination of the two theories and the coupling region will be compact and called K. Now, I'm not going to write down Lagrangians or anything like that. So how do I uh, say that I have a coupled version of this uh, uncoupled theory? Well, I'm going to assume that I have a quantum field theory called C and I will make the minimal assumption, which is that outside the causal hull uh, of our region K, the local algebras for our coupled variant are isomorphic to the ones for the uncoupled theory. So in other words, outside the causal hull, everything is as it was. Now, I also assume that this system of isomorphisms, one for every local region L, is compatible with some of the basic structure of the theory. And uh, in particular, I make sure that it's all compatible with isotony, which is a word for the rather obvious axiom that if uh, local region L is contained in local region N, then the uh, observables localizable in L should be among the, lo the observables localizable in N. So there should be inclusions like this in the coupled theory and in the uncoupled theory. And these isomorphisms that I'm writing down here must be compatible with all of those inclusions. Um, so that's a fairly minimal assumption about what a coupled version of A and B could be. So uh, we uh, consider these two theories. We now um, go to our uh, Lorentzian geometry uh, books and we identify an in region and an out region. And the in region is obtained by removing the causal future of region K, and the out region is obtained by removing the causal past of our region K. So these are geometrically uh, naturally identified regions. We don't need to assume any coordinates or anything like that to do it. And these M plus and M minus are legitimate regions for our quantum field theory. So they have local algebras. They also contain Cauchy surfaces. This is a general fact about globally hyperbolic space times and compact regions, that these in and out regions will contain Cauchy surfaces. And so a standing assumption of algebraic quantum field theory is that there are in the end going to be isomorphisms between um, the algebra for the whole space time and the algebra for the um, region containing a Cauchy surface, M plus or M minus. M plus and M minus are outside the coupling, the causal hull of the coupling region, so there should be an isomorphism to the coupled theory for the out or in or out region. And again, using this time slice axiom, um, this is to be identified with the uh, algebra, the coupled algebra for the whole space time. Putting it all of it together, I will get an isomorphism between the uncoupled theory and the coupled theory, one for the in region and one for the out region. 
So these will be called tor plus and minus. And uh, I can, of course, combine them to get a scattering operator, which maps from the uncoupled theory to itself. It's an isomorphism and uh, a, an algebra homomorphism. So this um, theta, this scattering operator, contains a lot of the information about the coupling. And in particular, it knows some of the localization properties of this coupling. For example, if we ask, what does it do to any observable that can be localized in the causal complement? That's what this perp means here, by the way. Any observable that's localizable in the causal complement of the coupling region, well, it leaves it alone. OK, so it acts as the identity outside the causal complement of the coupling region. So that's a locality property. And now we come to the measurement scheme. The slogan is prepare early and measure late. Better that than the other way around. And I'm going to use these tor plus minus as a sort of translator between the fictitious uncoupled language and the physical coupled system. OK, so these this is between the story we'd like to tell ourselves and what actually happens in the laboratory. So here's a uh, fictitious statement. We prepare the system and the probe in states omega and sigma at early times. OK, so that's talking about them as if they are separate things. Well, the translation is that we should do something to the coupled theory. And um, if we don't worry too much about the complicated formula here, there is what some, something you would recognize, omega tensor sigma, that is the, the uh, obvious uh, uncorrelated state between the system and probe in the uncoupled theory. Tor minus is the isomorphism between the uncoupled and coupled theory. And the inverse and the star are just what you need in order to uh, turn this into a state on the coupled theory, C of M. What it does, if you want, is to uh, give expectation values by the formula over here. We take an observable of the coupled system, we pull it back to the uncoupled system using the inverse of the identification at early times, and then we plug it into this uncorrelated state omega tensor sigma. So that gives you the expectation value. So that's the uh, way that we can uh, prepare the system and the state, or we can translate that fictitious statement to our coupled theory. Another thing that we might want to do is to measure a probe observable at late times. So B is a probe observable. I want to measure it. The translation is the following. Well, here is our identity or unit tensor B, which is in the uh, uncoupled combination of the two uh, theories. Tor plus carries us across to the coupled version. And so this is the observable of the coupled theory that we actually measure in, as it were, the laboratory. So um, the upshot is that our description of the measurement, preparing system and probe independently at early times and measuring a probe observable at late times, can be expressed in terms of measuring B tilde in state omega sub tilde. And now we need a detranslation. I discovered this morning that that is actually a real word in the linguistic literature. Um, and uh, but uh, I really want to say I'm going backwards against the uh, in the inverse direction to my translation. So uh, let's take the actual measurement uh, of B tilde in system state um, in, in state uh, omega tilde. And I want to interpret that back in my fictitious world, the measurement of an observable of the system in a system in the original system state. And I do that in such a way that the expectation values match up. Here we have the expectation value of the actual observable measured in the actual state in the actual coupled system. And over here, uh, I have the expectation value of some observable that I hope to be able to find in the state of the system. OK, so that's how I match things up. So, of course, you might think, ah, there's a bit of a pious hope here that uh, I can actually find an observable A that will make this work. In fact, it's not too hard to write down 
what it is. There is a map which involves this theta and a sort of conditional expectation map, uh, eta sub sigma, um, that actually does the job. And so A, the observable we wanted in the system, can be written as a well-defined map epsilon sub sigma acting on uh, B, the probe observable. So we don't need to worry too much about what the formula is, uh, merely that it involves this scattering map and a sort of conditional expectation. So um, I've shown you that every probe observable corresponds to a system observable, has an induced system observable. What are the properties? Well, you of course have to uh, make some assumptions, but the ones we make are fairly mild. Um, under those assumptions, uh, you can show that the induced observable for uh, of a, corresponding to a probe observable B is localizable in a region N, where N is any open, connected, causally convex subset containing the coupling region. So in other words, it has to be just a bit bigger than the causal hull of K. Anything bigger than that will contain it. So in other words, it's localizable in and around the coupling region, which is uh, makes good physical sense. If you take a probe observable that is actually space-like separated from the coupling region, then you can show the induced observable is nothing but a scalar multiple of the unit, which means you can learn absolutely nothing uh, about the system from it. And that's good because you shouldn't as if you're space-like separated from the coupling region. Another thing is well, we set everything up so that we had this equality of expectation values, that the expectation value of the induced observable should be the same as the expectation value that you get in the actual uh, experiment. But the variance doesn't have to be the same. And in fact, it's generally the case that the variance in the actual experiment is greater than or equal to the variance of this uh, induced system observable. And the reason for that is understandable simply as detector noise. So it's again, it's, it's what comes out of the mathematics, which has a very good physical uh, explanation. Related to this is the following, that if you take an effect in the probe and um, uh, an effect is just one of these true false measurements, um, then a probe effect will actually induce a system effect but a system effect that is typically unsharp. So even if you are able to measure a projector in the probe, the induced observable that corresponds to it will not in general be a projector because when you square it, you will get an operator that is smaller in the ordering of uh, operators uh, than the original, okay? Um, so you, you get an effect back, but just not a sharp one. So generically you're measuring unsharp things. So those of you who like POVMs should be cheering um, because that's, that's, where the, uh, that's where it all is. Um, just uh, to, to uh, enlarge on what I said about effects, um, as I said, the uh, effect is simply a true false measurement. Uh, it's measured modeled by a positive operator at such that one minus B is also positive operator and the probability of success or of getting true uh, is the expectation value in your state. And the uh, probability of failure or getting false is the expectation value of one minus B. So that's the uh, effects. So we've said something about observables and how we can interpret uh, measurements in the coupled system in terms of uh, measurements of local system observables. What about state update rules? It's a very obvious problem with quantum field theory that you cannot possibly expect the instantaneous state reduction idea of quantum mechanics to go across because it would appear to be frame dependent. So um, you would need to think very hard about what should replace it. Well, our view on this is that um, the purpose of state updates is to facilitate predictions. That's why 
you might have a state update rule. So for example, suppose there are two independent probes, both coupled to the system. And for the sake of argument, suppose that they are both measuring an effect. We measure both of these effects, A and B, and let's pose ourselves a question. If A is measured true, what is the probability that B will be measured as true or successful? So that is a physics question, right? Um, a subsidiary to that is, can this probability be expressed using an updated state? Maybe it can't, but I would regard this as subsidiary to the thing that I wanted to know in the first place, which is this conditional probability. So let's start from what we actually want, which is the conditional probability. Um, and let's also consider that we can combine the two probes and think of them as a single super probe, right? Just put them two apparatuses together and think of it as a single apparatus and combine the two effects as uh, their logical conjunction, success of both. And that should be described, of course, by the tensor product of the two effect operators. Quick comment, Chris. Uh, technically, five minutes left from your project talk, but again, you can bite uh, into the question time. If you okay, need. sure. So the conditional probability um, is given in the following way. Uh, we need the expectation value of this A and B in the state, and we have to divide the normalizing uh, properties by this um, uh, probability. Okay. And on the right hand side here, we only involve uh, outcomes for a single probe, and that's something we understand. So we can write a formula in terms of the uh, scattering map for the combined evolution and the scattering for A alone. So we come to the subsidiary question, which is, can we find a state omega A, uh, which will give us the right answer? Okay, so we want to find a state so that this conditional probability is the expectation value of B in state omega A. And under those circumstances, we would be justified in calling omega A the updated state. Okay. Right, so I'm going to, I've got my time warning, so I have to hurry a little bit. Um, what circumstances can we actually do this? Okay, well, I'm going to introduce some terminology. Whenever we have coupling regions separated by a Cauchy surface, we'll say that they are causally orderable. So as in the picture here, and you can of course have the situation where you can draw your Cauchy surfaces either way around, in which case either causal order is possible. And in any such circumstance, and even if you do it for N regions, we will talk about a compatible causal order, and we will have these funny triangles to indicate what's going on. It's reasonable to assume that the combined dynamics obeys what we call causal factorization, uh, which is to say that if coupling region A can be put before coupling region B in some compatible causal order, we have a factorization of the scattering map that it's equal to theta A after theta b. That's because we start in the future and then come back to the past. It's reasonable to assume this uh, because it holds in models and it's a standing assumption in uh, many other areas of quantum field theory. It's related to uh, Bogolyubov's factorization formulas, for example. Under this circumstance, in these situations, we can actually find a formula for this conditional probability, which is the value in a state and you can write a formula for what that uh, um, expectation value is. And this does justifies a state update rule from omega to omega a given successful measurement. The modified state is independent of the b measurement and the preparation for b and the theta for b, but it does depend not on the details of the A measurement, because we see the theta A there as well as the A. So it depends on how you measure as well as what you measure. And that's an important thing. So we've derived essentially the update rule here. 
And I emphasize that it's not necessary to assume that the state changes. This is bookkeeping. And I like a good accountant as much as the next person, but I'm not inclined to turn it into a law of nature. Um, it tells us how to predict what will happen next. So there are various properties of this. I'm going to skip over the first. The second I want to say is that there is consistency. If we have updates at space like separation, it doesn't matter which order you do it. So this is sound from that perspective. And it continues to end probes. You can extend this very happily. Um, one can also discuss non-selective measurement, where we do not select on the results of the measurement A, and then we will end up with a convex combination of the two um, possible outcomes. Okay, and interestingly, the formula we get for the non-selective update rule doesn't depend on the observable A at all. It is independent of what you measure, it's only dependent on how you measure it, which is kind of amusing. And a consequence of this is what I call the principle of blissful ignorance, which is that if you make measurement and then update the state, the expectation value for observables in the causal complement of the coupling region is unchanged. And that's good because you really shouldn't uh, experience any change to your experiments, or what goes on in somebody else's laboratory. Okay, I come to the impossible measurements. Here we go again. Alice chooses whether or not to make a non-selective measurement. Bob certainly makes a non-selective measurement. Charlie tries to work out whether or not A has measured. And the proof of the pudding is whether or not there is equality or inequality between the state uh, non-selectively updated for both A and B or just uh, non-selectively updated for B. Well, um, we analyze the uh, locality properties of the scattering map a bit more and discovered that theta B acting on observables of this form can actually be localized in a region N drawn here. The important thing is that this is in the causal complement of region A. And then a simple one line argument shows that the non-selective update rule for both A and B, which is given by this expression here, can be simplified because theta A will act trivially on this part of the expression, so it drops out. Theta B does not act on the A probe. So um, when that part will just drop out and we're left with the expression we would have had for the update rule for B alone. So this proves that um, Charlie can't tell whether Alice has measured or not. In other words, there are no impossible measurements, at least provided all the probes and couplings are described by local physics. So our slogan here is impossible measurements require impossible apparatus. So this sort of answers Sorkin's problem, but you can come back and ask it again in a different way. Which are the local observables that can be measured using local couplings? And this is the last uh, thing I want to tell you about. This is work in progress with Maximilian and Ian Job. Um, and uh, I'm going to give you a slight cheating argument that gives you hope that essentially every local observable can be measured. So our System and probes are going to be Klein-Gordon fields of the same mass. Uncoupled, they can be regarded as a complex field. The coupled variant is going to be the same thing, but with an external vector potential. And, the, uh, and it's pure gauge, actually. Uh, the, the chi is zero in the future, and it's pi by two in the past. So the uh, vector potential is non-vanishing only in the region between the Cauchy surfaces. The trick is, of course, that you can map between coupled and uh, uncoupled and coupled solutions just by multiplication. So it's easy to compute the scattering map. And when you do that, you find that theta maps a probe field to a system field and the same, uh, same smearing function. And that happens for all F. 
which means that the induced observable from a probe field phi p smeared with f is just the system field smeared with f. So all local observables can be measured. Why am I not cheering and uh, on my way to the bank? Um, well, I'm slightly unsatisfied that the interaction is non-compactly supported. It's between two Cauchy surfaces. Uh, so unless the Cauchy surfaces are compact, uh, we can't do very much about that. So uh, I come to the summary. Uh, I've shown you, I hope, how the operational framework uh, of quantum measurement theory adapts to AQFT. It's covariant. It works in curved space times. It's derived from minimal assumptions. We get uh, local system observables from probe observables, and we know where they live. We also derive state update rules from required properties rather than positing them. This is consistent. We're blissfully ignorant about what happens in our causal complement. There are no impossible measurements, and there's reason to hope that all, or at least essentially all, local system measurements uh, observables can be measured. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Chris, for the fantastic talk. All right, questions. Uh, remember to ask questions, uh, raise your hand, and I will give you the power to unmute yourselves. Oops, there we go. Nobody has any questions. Uh, I would have one if I can. Eduardo, I just can't find where to raise my hand. Um, am I allowed to ask a question? You are, totally. Okay. Hi, Chris. Th yeah, Hi. really. Thank you very much for this interesting talk. Um, I was wondering if you have seen uh, some recent work by uh, Yama and myself where we looked at the continuous we were setting up um, or coming up with a scheme of how to implement an Android detector in an analog gravity system. And we lose uh, uh, a laser beam, so electromagnetic field coupling to the density fluctuations in the condensate. And so we have two fields. One's are the probe fields, which is the electromagnetic field from the laser light. And the other one, the field the, which we're coupling to is this uh, a sort of the perturbations in, in, the, uh, in a superfluid, which follow a relativistic, I describe an effective relativistic field theory. Mm. Is this something that, you know, sort of could come to this idea uh, or what you had in mind? I'm just wondering if this is uh, of any interest to the work you're doing. I think it is. I mean, I think that what you've described is a, is a slightly less cartoon version of uh, my cartoon version in this, um, in this uh, picture here, actually. So, yes, I think that all, all of the um, quantum optics techniques of pumping to... Uh, change conditions in, in cavities and what you're describing in a condensate are examples. And um, probably, yeah, I would expect, I, I must admit, I haven't read your paper, but maybe I will do that now. Um, uh, sorry? I will good. send it to you right after. Oh yeah, that would, that would great, thank you. Um, but I would expect in the same way that, that as normal, you can um, sort of turn from the analog systems into quantum field theory and curved space time, the same translation would be possible here. And what, what my guess, not having read it, is that what you've described is an example or could be made into an example of this, absolutely. And so also we're using like a continuous fields rather than a two level systems. And just yes. wait, I have one more question. I, uh, I do, can I ask one, I wrote this up, but a very quick one. Ah, there's um, one person more, there's one more hand waiting, but just please do ask. Just try to make when, you talk, when you talk about a local measurement, um, so uh, in any realistic setting, locality is only given, like in our case, it is given by the width of the uh, laser beam, which also introduces a cutoff. I was just wondering if you want to add anything or have any, any yeah. thoughts of how you're taking this into account? So the locality here is in the uh, compactness of the coupling region. That's one aspect of it. Yeah. Um, and uh, so indeed, I would expect it to be um, spatially delocalized. Compactness is an assumption. You might say that's a bit of an over-idealization. Um, and actually with Benito uh, Juarez Aubrey, um, I'm working a little bit on, on that issue. 
at the moment. I hope you won't mind me mentioning that. Um, so, so this strict localization that you have with compact disc actually can be relaxed a little bit. But um, I think the, the point of principle is that it's certainly not at points. As you say, that there's, there's always going to be some spatial and spatiotemporal extent to any, any realistic measurement. Okay, thank you. There will also be talks about this, uh, I think, in the next section, but I'm going to send you the paper. So thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thank you, Silke. All right, uh, Rob, you have, uh, you can, I'm going to let you unmute yourself. There you go. Rob, you can unmute yourself. Okay, thanks. Yeah, uh, very interesting talk. If there is such a thing as indefinite causal order, is it possible to make impossible measurements? <laughs> Do you know, I haven't thought about that. Um, I mean, everything, everything that we've done here is really posited on the uh, background space-time being globally hyperbolic. So I think, I, I, uh, yeah, if I tried to give you a definite answer, I would just be making things up. Um, but um, I even, think it might be an interesting thing to think about. I think it would be. I think one the first thing that strikes me is I even need to think whether the question really makes sense. I think it's, but I think it would be even interesting to understand whether, that, whether it makes sense to ask that question. Do you see what I mean? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, uh, there are ideas that quantum gravity must have indefinite causal order. So, yes. I, I mean, it's, uh, I, I, the question is there, it seems to me. I think it'd be interesting to think about, that's all. I, I think what the, the, when I say it's whether I make sense is uh, whether you could really even think of uh, a violation of causality. What's going to be a violation of causality? when you have indefinite causal order. That's the bit that needs thinking through. Okay, yeah, not, not, good point. I take, I take the point that yes, you might also want to understand all of this in an indefinite causal order setting. All right, thank you, Rob. Uh, any more questions uh, now? Because uh, Silke pointed it out, good idea to mention uh, the raising hand feature should be under the button reactions at the bottom of the screen. But in any case, I'm going to do the same as before. I'm going to let you unmute yourselves now if you have more questions and you weren't able to raise your hand. So if anybody has any questions, or oh, Harris uh, has a question, you can unmute yourself, right? Uh, hopefully. Yes. Uh, hi, I have one question about the relay. For There exist, for example, easy models, not very sophisticated uh, mathematically wise, like Glauber's photodetection theory. In principle, you can use that for QFT measurements at large separations. Well, uh, have you tried your approach to this type of uh, um, well, photon numbers there? Right? Okay, so uh, I think that, um, I mean, the strict answer is no, but later mm -hmm. in the session, uh, Maximilian will talk about uh, relating this to local measurements of um, single modes, and I think what he's doing will be closer to what you're uh, what, what you're asking. So, so maybe wait for Maximilian's talk. All right. But yes, it's a good suggestion, uh, and and one I'm I'm aware of. All right. Thank you, Harris. Okay. I have one question on my own. Uh, uh, if there's nobody else, of course. All right, so a uh, couple of questions, maybe a comment on, on Harris's question. I think, Chris, though, that you do have a little bit of, um, of leeway to, to measure one or another observable, right? The, the, it's in the coupling, right? I guess if yes. the coupling is linear, sure, but if you can actually more elaborate and couple Oh, yes, yes. So this kind of like connects with how we do things in the lab. Depending on what we want to measure, we couple one way or another, right? So even, yeah. right. That's absolutely right. So. The toy model I gave you at the end, where you just steer things with this electromagnetic field, that's kind of, that's very, very simple. And uh, the more detailed results that Maximilian and Ian and I have do involve allowing ourselves to play with different couplings, uh, still mostly what we've been doing, uh, linear couplings, but in fact, 
um, nonlinear couplings certainly are allowed, fit into this framework, most certainly. There's, there's also one, one question that, uh, that comes to mind because of course the, the, this, uh, something that reminds me a little bit of the problem of the Heisenberg cut in a different way, uh, which is the fact that of course we have a quantum field and we measure the quantum field with a quantum field, which I think is the right thing to do. It's the most fundamental description. Mm -hmm. Problem yeah. is uh, that the moment we want to extract numbers, right, from, uh, from because uh, an experimentalist will tell you my result was 42. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, eventually this probe quantum field has to be measured again. Uh, uh, so so in, in, uh, usually, uh, at least in RQI, it's common to say, well, we model eventually a non-relativistic system on which we can do projective measurements without being afraid. So it's, it's the idea, it's something sim similar as in like you consider your system QFT uh, at a different level and you probe QFT somehow something that you can measure in a way at least effectively with some other means, right? Because eventually, how do you get out of the idea if QFT has problems to be measured and you measure it with another QFT, mm -hmm. what about the final step, right? As in which, how do we measure the measure, right? As you said. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't have a full answer to that. Um, but um, so I really, at this stage, I'm just measure, modeling the chain. Mm -hmm. And indeed, so the, the probe is probably something that gets measured by another quantum field and another and another and another. And as you say, there, there's this whole chain of things. What happens at the end and how it actually uh, comes to a, a definite answer, I'm not in a position to say. Um, ask me in another 15 years. <laughs> Get an idea, but uh, but the uh, but I think you can learn quite a lot by analysing the chain, actually, and and taking it as a given that we actually do measure things. So that there is um, there there is, there are measurements in the world, and uh, taking taking that so that at some point the chain somehow effectively is cut off, uh, and then work back down to the to what it can tell us about the fundamental field and that that's the uh, spirit in which I've been pursuing things. So, so do you want to say something? Before, yes, before so it, this is precisely what is sort of the the complication in this analog gravity setup, right? So you transferred some information from your analog relativistic field theory to, a, to this inter to an electromagnetic field, a laser beam. And so uh, while of course there's still the question how do you read it out and so forth, and, uh, but what one should also, uh, I think when making such a chain, one would transfer this information to a field where you can extract that information. So, you know, your auxiliary field has to be something that, you know, is a field where you can make this, you can get the information from the system that you want. So this, uh, this is precisely why this is so fantastic because you can, in a way, pick your auxiliary field and make this information accessible, but of course needs to be worked out in, in greater detail. Yeah, it has to be something that's very well coupled to something else as well, right? Which is going to be your, your measurement device. So you couple it to a, an electromagnetic field, that's good because they are very well coupled to photo detectors. Exactly, that's exactly. And this is why we're, uh, uh, I think, um, uh, Car has made this this thing like Glauber's mm. detector scheme and sure. so on that that you're back and also uh, in our case it's an interferometric scheme and yes. interferometers are uh, quantum metrology tools so mm. so so yeah it, that's exactly the exactly the point and this is in order to build a detector uh, you, in an analog gravity systems these are precisely the problems you need to resolve. So I think it is highly, all of this work, what you presented is highly relevant for, for setting this or, uh, you know, looking at analog radiation or detector physics in, in, the, in the context of analog gravity systems. Thanks. So, so then uh, the, uh, one uh, last comment, um, perhaps. Uh, again, uh, uh, Silke, please try to, to check if you can raise your hand because I do use the mute in just to check the reaction button. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm figuring it out. And yeah, no, no. I'm not doing it. I would just leave it uh, allowed to. There's one more thing, Chris, uh, uh, that I want to say. I'm mean, going to use my power a bit here because we're uh, running a five minutes delay or so. But uh, uh, the, um, for, from, the, from the fundamental point of view, I fully agree with everything that's been said, Silke, you, and everybody here. So I'm totally an advocate for this. Uh, the one problem that is fundamentally right is that 
in trying to give a fundamental description for the measurement problem in QFT, eventually we have to deal with the fact that uh, numbers can be extracted. And uh, the problem that we have is that uh, as long as the system is relativistic and we care about the relativistic features of the system, right? Um, the measurement problem will have a little bit of a problem unless we couple everything fully covariant, which is what you're pointing out. So, so maybe, maybe the key, and I want to hear your opinion on that, maybe the key, um, the key to this is finding under what conditions the probe systems or the chain that represents the probe systems, right, becomes arguably less relativistic somehow, in a way like that's not so important uh, by having some, some characteristic length scale or you know, some characteristic compact region of space, I mean, which is not so important to have a sorting problem, if you, if you know what I mean. Uh, somehow that, that emerges out of the description of the systems, mm -hmm. out of the interactions. Okay, I, so, I, your opinion there? so I would still take the view that all the couplings are covariant. I, agree, I fully agree with that. But if However, I, right, yeah, go ahead. if you have several billion electrons mm -hmm. sitting at, uh, in, at uh, mutual rest, that might give you uh, something of a prefer well, effectively a preferred rest frame, maybe. So having a very large system somehow, um, which, which actually establishes its local, has its own uh, standard of rest, might be your point of transition. But right. that's speculation. Right. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. Although you say, like, that's the thing, because like, if we put in a global detector, we're going to introduce a sorting problem again, but at some point it may not be important, <laughs> effectively. Maybe. There's one more question. Uh, you are allowed to unmute your... Um, yeah, you are. Uh, Don Page, I think, has a question. Sorry, is the raise hand feature not working today or something like that? Sorry, I don't... I'm, I'm sufficiently ignorant about Zoom to know how you raise your hand on Zoom. Uh, my apologies. It's just I don't see people when they want to talk. If, the, the thing with raising hand is that it puts you right on top of the queue. So that's why I, I recommend you do it. Okay, I'll have to learn how to use the raised hand. And no, I was just I was just commenting. I have a very speculative idea that maybe maybe ultimately. Well, let's let's take the really radical view that observations are ultimately sentient per sentient experiences or conscious perceptions. And then just, and then so I propose that for each one, there's some fundamental operator and the expect positive operator and the expectation oper value of that operator in the full quantum state of the universe is the measure of that, of that observation of that conscious perception. So then, then of course that wouldn't, that wouldn't have to change the state at all. I mean, it would be that the, the, the observations would be epiphenomena sitting on the state but it, it, it does seem to me that, that you do have to propose something new. I mean, that's that, that just the quantum evolution laws and the quantum state of the universe are not enough, that you really do need some rules for getting the probabilities of observations <clears throat> from the quantum state. And that these rules, as far as I can tell, cannot be deduced from just knowing what the quantum state <clears throat> is and, and, and how it evolves. And in, in other words, quantum field theory, even with all these couple systems, wouldn't be the wouldn't logically give what the what the probability of observations are and my proposal is that they're simply ex, uh, expectation values of a certain preferred set of <clears throat> of operators but of course this is a framework and not a theory because i certainly don't know what these operators are mm. so yeah i mean what i'm trying to do is um work within quantum field theory and see how much can be extracted right um and and i think I think that's reasonable. And when you reach the limit of what you can extract, then you have to think, OK, what else could there be? So for the moment, I'm trying to, to work, as it were, from the bottom up um, and uh, and see if I, how far we can go. We do actually uh, have these state update rules uh, and they are actually there, but they depend on assuming that someone somewhere knows how to measure something. So. If you're happy with the fact that there are numbers that come out of experiments, and then you want to know, well, what updated state should we now use to make further predictions? Then I think that quantum field theory answers that question. And, and that's, that's what we've got here. But I fully agree that this is not to be understood as a, as a full answer to the measurement problem, which is I think really more what you're trying to drive at. So the full uh, answer to the measurement problem requires more and maybe something, maybe something beyond uh, the framework that we've got. Um, 
um, perhaps of the sort you describe. Uh, but I, th I claim that there are good state update rules that can be used within quantum field theory, just as we have no problem saying what, what are the rules uh, for updating states in quantum mechanics uh, when we're teaching our students. Yeah, very good. I, no, I agree. And it was a very, very beautiful talk. I didn't mean to be oh, exactly no, no, no. but I, as you pointed out that this issue of how do you get to the end, you know, yeah. I'll just say, well, at least I have a proposal for a framework, but it's not yeah. a theory because I don't know what the operators are. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. Seth. Again, uh, we're running a little bit of a delay, but this is, to me, in my opinion, this is the most important part of having a, an event like this. Uh, so I'm going to give the last question to Alex, who raised hands. Alex, uh, please, floor is yours, but be as, as fast as you can be. Okay, I'll be very quick. Thanks, Chris, for the very nice talk. I just wanted to quickly add uh, the state update rule that you wrote down, and yeah. you're deriving it from this conditional probability. So uh, two questions. One, have you been able to write the state update rule in terms of like a Krauss representation, sort of in terms of like importing the measurement theory into AQFT, like, like an operator sum decomposition of the state update rule? And then we just... Okay, all right, no, maybe that was the first part, go ahead. Okay, uh, that is something I haven't looked at so much. Maximilian has a bit, I'm just looking at Max, I can see Maximilian, I don't know whether you can. Maximilian is nodding, yes. Maximilian is the person to ask about that. So up okay. to a point we have, yes. Great, the, the, great, the, okay. This is not yet, uh, this is not yet um, published work. No, wonderful, wonderful. Um, and then the, the sort of the update rule in this conditional probability, um, I was just kind of wondering how it depends on, uh, or I just don't see explicitly how it sort of depends on the hypersurface that those probabilities are being computed on or something. There's like no that. hypersurface in Okay, so this is, right, okay, so this is my confusion then, like somehow those prob, like, are those probabilities not calculated at an instant of time? No, or no, they're... not at all. So there are two things that happen. You could get yes or no to, to each of two measurements. Uh, and the question is, what is the conditional probability for one of them happening given that the other one definitely does. And, uh, and that is a straightforward answer. You can answer that at the end of time when you get together with the other experimenter, you analyze the data. There's nothing about any Cauchy surfaces in, in, in here. Okay, okay, maybe I guess like, maybe I can say it a slightly different way is that the probability distributions appearing in the numerator and the denominator, right? Yeah. Two different ones. Do they not have to be evaluated on, on on the same Cauchy surface or something no. like that, or no? no. Okay, no. all right. So the, everything's. I, I use the Heisenberg picture, so um, you know it is what it is. So you take the expectation value of a certain observable in in okay. this state. <laughs> right. Okay. All right. All right. Thank maybe, you very much. Maybe Thank it's you. helpful to think about it in terms of scattering uh, uh, processes, right? I mean, scattering theory that may help Alex. No. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I guess, yeah, if, if um, yeah, that would so be one you way. You have a region, I guess you have a region of interaction, right? That's the thing. That's what tells you when things happen, in a way, you know, the measurement happens. Yeah. yeah. So right. You do it in okay, the maybe it's like pushed back into the coupling and when the coupling happens or something yes, like that. And maybe right. that's synchronized across the numerator and denominator in some way. Maybe that's the, but yeah, okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Chris. This was uh, an amazing talk, and I'm really happy to see that there was a discussion about it. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much again. Let's thank uh, Chris again. Or at least I will, on behalf of everybody else that are muted. <laughs> and uh, there's also some uh, advice here people wrote, because in different platforms, apparently, uh, the raise hand feature is in different places. <laughs> I don't know why. But uh, you can find it. Some people will find it under the button reactions. Some people may find it on clicking on participants. And, and if not, I will just allow people to unmute themselves like uh, I did because uh, Silke and, and, uh, and, and Don both uh, was difficult to find. So let's try to do it. I'll try it, I'll do it first with the hand, but if not, try to be visible uh, and Rick will see you because I think that's what worked for Don. So Rick will pay, pay attention to the video and see. All right, perfect. All right, uh, okay, so we have our next talk. Uh, People, are you ready? Yeah. Okay, so maybe share screen and I'll introduce you. Yeah. Let's check that everything works. Mm -hmm. You can see? Yep. We're going back to impossible measurements. Yeah. yeah. Can you do full screen? It's a little bit uh, not ideal, I think.
Can you see? Much better. No, it's not screen. Perfect, perfect. It works. It might okay. be a delay. Uh, all right. So our next speaker for the day is Jose de Ramon Rivera, also known as People, for those of you who have talked with him. And he's going to talk to us about uh, something related to, uh, to uh, Chris's talk, uh, relativistic causality in particle detector models, faster than light signaling, and impossible measurements. People, uh, you're not showing video. I think that's probably on purpose. Uh, but the floor is yours. Yeah. OK, give me a second. I should be able to. Uh... Now I can see your face. Right. Ah, OK, cool. You go back to full screen. Yeah. Oh, sorry. There we go. There we go. OK, floor is yours. OK, thank you very much for organizing this conference in these difficult times. Today, I'm going to present this work in collaboration with uh, Maria Papa Giordiu and Eduardo. So basically, there's a lot of overlap between this talk or this work and what uh, Professor Fuster was talking about. I'm going to talk about impossible measurements and faster than signaling, but I'm going to constrain myself uh, to the uh, framework of uh, Andrew DeWitt de detectors. Okay. So this is the outline. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about, well, a little bit more, if you want, about the measurements in QFT, how we think about them. I'm going to uh, talk about how this motivates the introduction of particle detector models. Concretely, we're going to talk about Android with type models. I'm going to discuss whether one has faster than light signaling in these setups. And uh, we're going to talk about the, this problem that uh, Professor Fuster was referring to of impossible measurements, but within this concrete uh, setup that is rather pop has been rather popular in the literature to discuss many things in of uh, right uh, to quantum field theory in space times right so how do we think about measurement theory in quantum field theory well so we know that we have as uh, professor Fuster was pointing out a quantum measurement theory in the framework of quantum mechanics. Indeed, we can calculate pr probabilities associated with uh, projector value measures that are linked to properties of certain uh, physical systems or more generally of positive operator value measures. And we have this notion of state update uh, that tells us what the state of the system is after we measure certain outcomes. Uh, as uh, we're talking, uh, before this enter this is a dot uh, with uh, relativistic theories uh, from uh, many points of view. Uh, there is not such thing as a relativistic quantum mechanics in the sense of position operators and their dynamics, because there's no way of constructing a non-trivial position operator in the sense of a projector value measure associated with the position of a particle in space-time that is uh, um, that uh, put together with some conditions related to relativistic causality, for instance, micro causality or independence of measurements in space like separated regions. This is a result due to Maramend in 1996. So, uh, this is usually regarded as an argument for uh, saying, kind of, that the, to talk about a quantum theory in a relativistic setup, one has to use the formal step of quantum fields. But even within the formation of quantum fields, there's no notion of having finite rank projectors that are assigned to properties, let's say, that can be performed locally. And this is an algebraic uh, property of uh, most uh, common quantum field theories. And something that's been analyzed within the framework of algebraic field theory. Uh, but the, beyond these technical complications, the, as uh, Professor Fuster was pointing out too, there's, the notion of state at date is adults with relativistic causality because it talks about an intervention that happens instantaneously and in a non-global, uh, sorry, in a global manner uh, within the manifold where the quantum field is defined. So we want to discuss Boynomine type of measurements if we would use a probe to uh, measure the properties of the quantum field or the quantum field state. Uh, in a way that we can, that we know and that we're familiar with, with PBMs, etc. Basically, using a non-relativistic system. 
So uh, the paradigm of this kind of probe uh, in relativistic photometry is related to relativistic setups is the so-called Andrew de Witt model. The Andrew de Witt model, um, as we see here in its most popular form, represents a quantum system and usually a two-level system that is coupled locally to a quantum field and linearly along a trajectory of the field, sorry, of the, uh, along a trajectory of the detector and that generates evolution respect to the proper time of the detector, where this tau is the proper time of the detector. So this uh, model is mathematically very singular because this operator here is not well-defined because the field amplitude is not a well-defined operator at the point, right? So that makes this whole uh, interaction Hamiltonian in the interaction picture not being a well-defined object. It requires further specification. So this motivates the introduction of smear detectors or extended detectors that uh, interact with the quantum field over some region. In this case, one can always talk or at least can collect a very wide family of models that uh, describe this situation with Hamiltonian densities of this kind, which are integrated not over time, but over time and space. So this Hamiltonian density is um, specified by this space-time smearing, this operator that only depends on the detector degrees of freedom and again, the smear the, the field amplitude, which in this case will has to be understood as a distribution acting over this space-time smearing. We, in this talk, we will consider like uh, in uh, the setup that the Professor Fuster was discussing that this function is space-time compact. So this object can be used to particularize many uh, situations that they are used in experimental setups like atomic physics, optical cavities, etc., which allows to perform uh, predictive value measures or whatever kind of measure, uh, measurement one is um, interested in or used to in experimental setups through uh, this operator J associated with the detector. And since it's a Hamiltonian density, it can be uh, applied uh, or extended right away to quantum fields that are defined in globally hyperbolic spacetimes, as it was shown in this reference here. So the way one defines a new interaction Hamiltonian uh, from a Hamiltonian density is by integrating this the Hamiltonian density over a family of space uh, space like surfaces indexed by uh, some parameter that we will identify with the time that the Hamiltonian is generated evolution upon. So, uh, in order to discuss uh, signaling between detectors, we need to discuss uh, the situation when one has multiple detectors and how the, 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 their common statistics behave after the interactions, right? So, the way we uh, introduce several detectors is uh, the most natural way, it's just uh, summing or adding up uh, different uh, Hamiltonian densities associated with different detectors. And we assume that the degrees of freedom of each of the detectors are independent. This is very similar to uh, the setup uh, in a previous talk, maybe more uh, common quantum mechanical terms. So the evolution will be given by the scattering operator that is basically like the scattering morphism that was discussed before. Uh, there will, that in this talk we will consider is given by the time order exponential of the sum of the Hamiltonians expressed respect to the a common uh, foliation, if you want, or like a common uh, time parameter. So it's not clear from this expression, given that these objects here are non-relativistic, how this uh, object is going to behave respect to signaling. So let me present three examples and we can think together about whether um, uh, how we would expect in a non-relativistic system or a relativistic system. So 
these uh, objects here, uh, you can interpret it as light icon or as two Cauchy surfaces. Um, so we say that this, uh, we ask whether in gray will be affected by the interaction uh, constraint in this region uh, associated with detector B, right? So clearly in this setup, we would expect that whatever foliation we choose to define our detector model, B won't uh, affect A because there won't be a foliation such that any uh, event in B will have uh, be uh, before detector A and basically the time ordering uh, that we've defined here will prevent any kind of influence of B over A. Uh, respect to the second case, we would expect that if the theory is non-relativistic, uh, the influence of, of B on detector A, uh, sorry, of detector B over A will depend very much on which uh, time of, uh, parameter we're choosing to uh, define the evolution. But if we have a, if we, if these uh, detector models are to predict, uh, to make relativistic predictions, we would uh, like the B to not influence A at all for their space like separated. A similar case happens in this third case because if you realize B is uh, basically in the causal future of A but has some leakage over outside the Lycon. So for some observers, some events belonging to this object B, this detector B will go before uh, this the object A. Um, so this, uh, this is an example of uh, what the, in the previous talk was called causally orderable set, which is a covariant notion. But that is not clear that it's gonna work in a non-relativistic setup. So the answer is that, at least in our case with the, the micro-causality action that says that uh, the field amplitude commutes with itself when the arguments are in space like separation implies that for different detectors, because the internal degrees of freedom of the detectors are uh, independent, also commutes in space like separation. This implies again, this what it was called causal factorization in the S matrix, at least um, the, the proof is uh, rather formal if you want, but uh, it's logical that this is gonna happen, implies that in this one line argument that uh, the local statistics of uh, detector A in all three cases before won't be affected by the interaction B at all. Just you can see this because the local statistics of A will be the total evolved initial conditions of the field plus detector system uh, with the partial trace over B and the field performed. And uh, this causal factorization will, and the um, cyclic property of the trace will uh, make the contribution of detector B disappear. So it seems that at least uh, very formally, the, this, uh, we, one, one would expect that this kind of Andrew DeWitt type models are okay with respect to uh, bipartite signaling in the sense that they, in two detector scenarios. So, but what happens with the impossible measurements? Well, um, remember that the, as um, uh, Professor Fuster was uh, saying, uh, the, this result of uh, Raphael Sorkin in 1993 uh, was uh, put into question whether one can actually measure things in a quantum field without uh, this, the whatever uh, transformation or notion of intervention that we have of the, uh, on the quantum field to propagate signals superluminally. Uh, and clearly in their framework, this uh, doesn't happen because everything is covariant and not only that, but there's scattering morphisms that are assumed to have nice localization properties, or, et cetera. Uh, the question is, will detector B in this case learn anything about C just because detector A is there even though C and B are in space-like separation? So uh, a way to rephrase that is consider that C is an arbitrary unitary uh, acting over some uh, weird region C and that the initial conditions are given by any reference state. It could be for instance, the vacuum if you want times this unitary. Should, uh, what it should hold is that the local statistics of B that are given by this density matrix here 
don't depend on the operator u. Or equivalently, that if we think about any operator acting over detector b, if this object that can be thought as an induced observable over the field commutes with this operator here that can be thought as the propagation of this initial data, both over C, uh, evolve in the interaction picture. So that is that if we have uh, that, well, the first, um, this condition is kind of similar to what the, was called a case by case scenario before um, by Professor Fuster, and you can find it in the reference. Basically, what we're demanding with this condition is that uh, this initial data is propagated within the Lycon of U. So the thing is that this is not going to happen in our case. Because even though uh, the Hamiltonian densities associated with different detectors commit in space like separation due to the independence of the uh, detector degrees of freedom, for the same detector, this is not going to happen anymore. And the dynamics within the region A, for instance, are going to be non relativistic. So there's going to be instantaneous propagation of data, if you want. What's going to happen, the way we are going to understand impossible measurements in this case, is that the region C is going to communicate something to region A, then that information is going to travel instantaneously within the detector, and then that information is going to propagate again. And that's what makes uh, detector B uh, um, susceptible to uh, information that comes from uh, detector C. So how much uh, should we care about this? Well, first, uh, this picture here is telling us that indeed what happens is that uh, if we're describing systems uh, that are small enough, um, if you want, uh, depending on the scale of the problem, the, the problem is not very bad. So the light cones are not enlarged very much, depend if we were treating detectors that are very small. Um, the reason why is because the information can uh, propagate uh, superluminally only within the detector. Apart uh, outside the detector, the information still propagates at the speed of light. Another thing, maybe even more important, is that this is a to like, uh, just to come like someone that may have not been exposed to this problem before and has worked with the detector models the interaction uh, strength plays a role in here. Uh, imagine that the, in region C, this information is encoded with a third detector. Then uh, this uh, possible measurement uh, setup, it becomes uh, a fourth order uh, effect in the coupling constants of all the detectors uh, involved. The reason why is because the detector C has to see if you want a signal in space time that has to travel to detector A, that has to read it and then send it back. We already have third order in perturbation theory. And this has to be read uh, by detector B to cause this like a, a supernumeral signaling, which uh, in total gives a fourth order uh, contribution to the statistics of the detectors. Most setups discussed in the literature are only second order calculations because those are the ones that describe, for instance, uh, thermalization, particle creation, etc. This may be relevant in no perturbative calculations or with multiple detectors or uh, in situations which one, like Gaussian quantum mechanics, in which one can actually calculate uh, non perturbatively contributions of coherent states or localites, etc. Uh, some concluding remarks, the micro-causality uh, condition enforces that a particle detector, in the sense that we've described in this talk, can only receive signals from its causal past. Uh, however, non-relativistic dynamics cause some sort of impossible measurement type problems that in the case of uh, this kind of moment type measurements are related to the extension of the detector and the non-relativistic mechanics within the interaction region. Uh, from the practical point of view, detector models are safe uh, as far as the size of the detector doesn't play a relevant role, almost point like detectors. 
and um, uh, when we use uh, low order simple perturbation theory, uh, for instance, like when we talk even uh, about the master equations, etc., and the weak coupling limit, or homogeneous states of the field that is, we don't use states that have a lot of local information. So uh, just to uh, finish this approach and this uh, quantitative analysis, um, because one can actually uh, calculate the contributions uh, order by order of all these uh, super um, uh, superluminal signals. Um, and write them in terms of the correlators of the fields and the correlators in the detectors, which uh, makes it uh, good for experimental setups. So thank you very much. Um, all right, thank you very much, people. All right, as usual, let's try, let's try for the questions. Um, to use the raise hand feature if possible. So let's open a, a round for raising hands. I don't see anybody raising hands. Okay. Uh, oh, just uh, oh, don't don't you found it? That's so good. <laughs> uh, you can unmute yourself. Don. Uh, can you hear me, Don? Oh, there we go. Yeah, no, okay. This, this was just a really sort of uh, very tangential comment that I recently had the crazy idea that I posted as a, 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 on the archive a few months ago that maybe because, because if observations are described by expectation values of some operators, these operators themselves are likely to be non-local. Now, most probably I would think that they don't act back on the state, but suppose you suppose that, that whatever operator maybe corresponds to some brain state, suppose it is non-local in a human brain, possibly the human brain could act like a non-relativistic object in the sense of the talk that maybe information could get propagated acausally inside of a human brain. Anyway, that, it's a really crazy proposal. I think the probability of this is very tiny, but if it were true, if one could ever somehow stick probes into a human brain and find there's acausal propagation, within it, that would be extremely exciting. So I think it's it's a very low probability thing because you know even if there are these non-local operators whose expectation values give the probabilities of observations, I, sus I, I suspect that it, it seems simplest that they just don't act back on the state at all. That the, 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 these conscious observations are just epiphenomena and they ride along with the state, but they don't affect the state. But in the remote possibility that they do, it would be extremely exciting if one could find non-local propagation inside of conscious beings. Uh, I'm sorry, Don. Uh, why would you need such a complex system to try to 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 achieve, achieve this goal? Why wouldn't any other simpler non-conscious system uh, be able to to actually achieve the same goal? What would be different about consciousness? Well, I, I I'm I'm just saying that the only motivation I have for for thinking that maybe some some non-local that there could be some non-local term in the in the Hamiltonian density, or well, it wouldn't really be density, but in the Hamiltonian, there's some non-local term that it isn't just the integral of a local Hamiltonian. It, it, the, it, I'm just saying a motivation for that is that if indeed the, the, the measures of conscious perceptions are given by operators, it seems most likely that these operators are going to be non-local. I mean, I don't the, the richness of our conscious perceptions seem to demand more than just measurements of, of, of fields that are localized at points. Well, and of course those aren't even well defined. So oh. I'm just saying that's the motivation. It's come from that. And if that's true, then these, then, then if, if you have a, uh, some system that's not conscious, then presumably the expectation by these operators are very tiny or, you know, more time, more small. And so therefore they might be, they're more, less, le less likely to have any effect on the Hamiltonian. So I'm just saying that in conscious beings is where these operators may have, you know, higher so, expectation values because that, that's, they produce consciousness. And, and so if, well, indeed, sorry. if that's true, that's where you might, that's where I would take it most likely to, to expect them to, to exist, though even there, I don't, I'm, I'm not at all convinced that they really would exist, but I'm just saying if they exist, I have a motivation for thinking they should exist inside conscious beings because that's 
where these expectation values uh, of the operators whose expectation values give measures of conscious perceptions are indeed large. Well, I would say that maybe what happens is that consciousness, well, I, I, I'm just like mumbling at this point. Uh, I'm not an expert in these things, but it may happen that the consciousness is a macroscopic defect that requires some uh, cross graining or non-locality indeed. So, yeah, when, right. one the question is, does this non-locality, does this non-locality act back on the quantum state? I think it's most probable that it doesn't, but I'm saying there, there, there might be some small probability that the that the the full theory of the universe is such that this non-locality does act back on the state, and in that case, in principle, there might be a causal propagation inside of conscious beings, inside the brains of well, inside brains that produce consciousness. Well, I don't know. Maybe it has more to do with how you describe the process itself of. Um realizing something i don't know um so 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 maybe one thing that uh, if if people uh, what people is telling us in a way uh, i think that just to 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 answer this what people are telling us in a way is that if there is a, if imagine so of, of course the whole approach here assumes that non localities in a in a relativistic the measurement of a relativistic field is a bad thing <laughs> but we start from that but the the if, if we were to tolerate is to say imagine there would be interesting to find non localities in some scenario right what people is telling us is that, well, it's going to be really difficult. It's going to be darn difficult because the effects of those non-localities, at least when you model things with particle detectors like this, uh, the effects of those non-localities are really tiny in, in most setups. Definitely, if you put scales here, the effects, one of the conclusions of people was, uh, oh, the effects are really not present in most processes that, are, that you would be observing, right? Those are, they would be tiny. The back reaction on the field, which is what people is considering, yeah. doesn't really allow for supernominal signal in a way that you can perceive. I mean, so most experimental setups don't experience, don't experience the, well, don't analyze this sort of uh, non-Markovian dynamics that happens uh, in this kind of physical processes, right? That would be the responsible for this kind of effects that would be already small if we model um, atoms, for instance, have so, something that has a finite size. So it would be, the idea is that the, uh, what kind of things go beyond the regime of validity of these models. So what the, this kind of thing is telling you is like, okay, you need no Markovian effects and you need the, your objects and your, well, your devices to uh, be large enough uh, to go beyond the, the, the to, to uh, go beyond the regime of validity of the, these kind of uh, measurement schemes, right? Just so happen. one would need like an atom uh, that is like something that is usually small enough that the, all the relevant wavelengths in experimental setups are beyond the size of the atom and the size uh, doesn't affect anymore. Or uh, if you have condensed matter systems, well, you would have Lee Robinson bounds and I don't know, other results that are going, that they're telling you that everything's gonna be okay. And that's the reason why these things are not measured. Well, not not what well, they cannot be measured because they shouldn't be true, but the, they're not uh, in contrast with what the so they want the not weird things are found. Yeah, that's how I think about it. Not only do I think it's it's that it, principle, it seems to be unlikely that there's any effect at all from not, if even if there are these non-local operators for conscious things. But then, secondly, because I can't, I don't have any any firm prediction that they that they that they should act back on the state. How much they do is it might well be so small that even if it did exist, it would be way too small to be measured in the foreseeable future. Right. So, so I, uh, I I do agree with that. People, I don't know if you want to say something. Harris has a question as well. Hmm. Uh, well, I think people answered my question. I wanted to ask about the size of this non-causality because when we model a measurement, we always make some assumptions that are not expressed mathematically. So I wonder, I mean, in the model, I mean. So I wonder if this particular type of non-locality, this is the types that are really hidden under, uh, well, the intrinsic uncertainties of the measurement or if they can be uh, distilled in some sense. Well, when one uh, models this J operator, right? This current that is associated with whatever system you're uh, dealing with and you model its dynamics, 
there's always like a hidden assumptions because you should be modeling that object as a quantum field like uh, Professor Fuster does, but you're not because you need to measure over bound states and well, you need to know the kind of things that you know how to do, right? So those are the, so for instance, if you have atoms, uh, are you modeling a gas, are you modeling a material in which you have uh, some dielectric constant or whatever that is not defined covariantly? Yeah, I mean, so yeah, the, all, the, those, all those localities uh, should be under the definition of J. All right. Uh, are there any more questions? We have a uh, baby room for one more. If there's anybody. All right, if not, maybe just one, one quick question of, of my own. Uh, so, so people, just, to, just to, to try to center the message, would it, be, would it be fair to say that we can understand, okay, uh, of course, non-local, not, not point-like particle detector models, such not delocalized under the detectors or smeared under, especially extended under the detectors, will have uh, sorking problems, sorking impossible measurement problems, but uh, would it be fair to say that, well, but probably you don't need to care anymore in the usual usage that we do, at least in relativistic quantum information or in, or in uh, quantum fields in curved space. Would that be a fair statement? Do you agree or disagree? Well, I think uh, this result is telling us two things. One is that in principle, in all things that have been done in the past or most of them, uh, this is not gonna be a problem. Uh, but also it's telling you what the regime of validities of these models and it's telling you where you have to go beyond, right? Yep. Um, so what kind of setups are gonna reveal this kind of behavior, which is exciting in my opinion. I fully agree, but then again, I'm biased. Anyway, thank you very much uh, people. And thank you about everybody. I'm enjoying very much this session. We ran a bit of a delay. So if any of the speakers uh, or at least the last speaker, Harris, if you have a, if you need to go or something, let me know. And maybe we can we can try to do something about it. But I do enjoy when the, the conference becomes a place to discuss and debate and, and contrast ideas. Of all, in a time like now that we don't get to do it in person and we can talk uh, during the coffee break. So that's why I'm being lenient with this. Anyway, thank you very much, people. Let's thank you again. I thank you on behalf of all the muted people in the room. And uh, let's proceed with the next speaker. I'm going to pause the recording. All right, so the next speaker is Maximilian Hulert, and he's going to tell us about, he's at the University of York, and he's going to tell us about weekly couple local particle detectors, kind of harvest entanglement, and look forward to this talk along the lines of the previous one. The floor is yours, Max. Thank you very much. And um, well, I would also like to thank the organizers for uh, setting up such a nice online conference and, uh, of course, for giving me the opportunity to talk about my project. Um, Okay, so let's start. Here is the outline of what I want to say. First, um, I will be setting the stage. I will, uh, well, uh, start um, by talking or rather um, revising the, the concept of model independent uh, entanglement harvesting. And then I will quickly talk about certain uh, particle detector models that are commonly used in the entanglement harvesting protocol and also their uh, imperfections which is then a uh, motivation to go over to the second block where I will um, talk about uh, the, uh, the local probes that uh, Chris already extensively talked about. At least well, I will talk uh, a little bit about, about certain aspects that are important for, for this work. Um, in particular, I will talk about how a certain subsystem of a certain local probe can be viewed as a local particle detector, um, which is uh, free of, of the imperfections of um, commonly used particle detector models. And um, crucially, I will also talk about uh, the initial preparation states, the possible realistic, let's say, initial preparation states of these local particle detectors. And then uh, in the end, um, in, the, in the third part, I will discuss the entanglement harvesting protocol with such local particle detectors. And for that, I need to first talk about, well, um, entanglement, which uh, will then directly lead us to the, the main result, if you want, which is that there exists a coupling strength threshold for entanglement harvesting by local particle detectors 
which then also um, explains the title, uh, weakly coupled local particle detectors cannot harvest entanglement. And finally, in the end, I plan to mention some interesting uh, open questions and points worth discussing. So um, let me set the stage. So uh, what is entanglement harvesting? So the first observation concerns um, quantum field theory on globally hyperbolic space time. And there the first observation is that many states of um, a quantum field on a globally hyperbolic space time um, are entangled on local observables of space like separated regions, for instance, uh, this, this zone A and zone B. So um, you take your quantum field in a globally hyperbolic space time. So here this is a space time diagram. This is uh, zone A, zone B you look at the observables that can be localized in this zone A and this zone B, and then you take a, a global state of your, of your quantum field, you restrict it to this, um, to this algebra generated by the observables in here and the observables in here, and you observe that the state restricted to, to this algebra here and this algebra here is entangled. Um, this is a, a, a general fact. Many states have this property um, and an important class of states that has this property is the class of rich leader states. So rich leader states in particular comprise uh, ground and thermal states of free theories on uh, stationary real analytic space times. And uh, the advantage of these ground and thermal states is that they are even uh, quasi free or, or Gaussian, what is known as, as, as Gaussian. So in some sense, they are, they are very simple um, to, to get your hand on them. So um, entanglement is present in, in, in many states. That's the main message here. And then, well, here entanglement harvesting uh, from a quantum field theory, how does that work? Well, it's very schematically. So you take two physical uh, structures initially uncorrelated. So if you want the blue and the red line here, you couple them each in a compact coupling zone, A and B respectively. So this is um, so this compact coupling zone you will be uh, familiar with from Chris's talk. This will be reminiscent of that. So you couple uh, the blue one in the compact coupling zone, the blue compact coupling zone, the red one in the red compact coupling zone. And um, in the end, you hope that um, because of the interaction with the quantum field in these two coupling zones, you will end up with two um, entangled physical structures in the end depicted by this. Um, so indeed, uh, this entanglement harvesting has been shown with the use of uh, um, particle detector models and commonly used particle detector models for this purpose are um, these, uh, these two non-relativistic uh, particle detector models with the main advantage that they basically have a very simple internal dynamics. So um, let me go over them. The first example is a quantum mechanical harmonic oscillator detector depicted by um, this spring here in which Alice couples, well, a quantum mechanical harmonic oscillator to a quantum field along or around a world line here. And if she only couples for a finite amount of time, then this world line um, around or along which the coupling is active will actually fit into a compact coupling zone. So will fit into this framework. And um, typically, her, um, this, this, her particle detector, her harmonic oscillator, is prepared in its ground state, which is in particular a pure quasi-free state here. It's in its ground state. Another um, common model is a two-level detector, where Alice couples a qubit, so here a two-level system, a qubit to a quantum field, again, along or around the world line. And again, it's usually taken to be in its ground or excited state, which is also pure state. And those are commonly uh, used detector models, but um, unfortunately, they are imperfect. And the imperfection is, uh, we, uh, we heard of this imperfection in the last talk. So um, if you want to couple something along a world line, you run into the problem that the coupling is singular. That means that the equations of motion will contain a distributional term. And um, this resulting emerging equation of motion is, is not so nice. You could even say unphysical. And the other problem that you face is um, in order to, to avoid this singular behavior, you could smear out the detector. You could couple 
this detector around the world line, but then you run into the problem that uh, the emerging classical equations of motion are non-local. And as we saw in, in, in the last talk, this non-locality can in principle, in, in general, um, cause some uh, causality issues, although we saw that you can control them in a certain way, but still from a, if you want from a, from a fundamental point of view, these are still uh, imperfections, despite they can be controlled. Okay, and uh, let me again point out that uh, the main advantage here is the easy internal dynamics of these common particle detector models. Good, so um, we're done with setting the stage. We talked about entanglement harvesting, how two physical structures coupled to a QFD can get entangled, and that those non-relativistic detectors that are usually used to discuss this protocol um, have imperfections, uh, that is a singular or non-local equations of motion. And in some sense, this is um, exactly the, uh, the motivation to go to the, uh, to the second part now, where the idea is to talk about local particle detectors that um, avoid these imperfections of um, singular and non-local behavior. And for that, uh, let me start with a local probe. So this will be a, a revision of a, of a part of what Chris talked about. So um, let us talk about these local probes. So we have this uh, concept of system and probe as Chris talked about. So let me just remind you that we had a local system quantum field theory of interest and a local probe quantum field theory of interest. And the idea was that we coupled them together in some compact coupling zone here to form um, a proper local bona fide quantum field theory associated to the interacting system the interacting structure of system and probe. And then uh, also, as, as Chris talked about, the idea is that um, on the level of the states, we can then describe the interaction um, in, in terms of a scattering map. And uh, let, me, let me also um, reinforce this point that Chris made that uh, you basically the interaction um, in the language of the free combination of the system and the probe. So if you want in terms of the tensor product theory. Okay, but now what is the interaction? Um, uh, what is the scattering? So um, if you start with an initial system state, omega and initial probe state, sigma, then the, uh, the interaction causes an update or can be described in terms of an update given by this expression where you just compose your um, composition with uh, the scattering map. Now, um, if uh, you do not want to talk about abstract states and abstract algebras and abstract uh, automorphisms of the algebra, you could very well assume that um, your algebra is represented by operators on a Hilbert space, that your states are given as uh, traces over density matrices here, and even that your uh, scattering map is implemented in terms of a unitary action of a scattering operator. So the action of a unitary scattering matrix S here. And then suddenly this uh, line here becomes uh, the well-known um, update of uh, density matrices due to um, a scattering matrix. And I think there was also, uh, let me maybe quickly um, answer uh, or, or get back to, to a question that, uh, that, that we had in, in the discussion of Chris's talk. Basically, if you look at this expression now, and if you, well, Chris was interested in the system, if you now trace out the, the probe, if you want, you get uh, basically exactly back the um, update of a state in terms of Krauss operators, if you want, okay? Um, but as we will see later, we are uh, not interested in, uh, in the system, funnily enough, but we are interested in the probes, right? Because uh, we want to look at uh, entanglement harvesting. But before we get to that, let me first talk about the concrete example of uh, system and probe. So um, this is given in terms of uh, this uh, Lagrangian density where we have Psi, a system field of interest, Phi A, um, Ellis's probe field with uh, this free Lagrangian density. And then we have um, a coupling term here. So we have just a bilinear coupling between the system and the probe field we have row A, which is a coupling, a coupling function, a real valued, smooth, compactly supported coupling function with, uh, which uh, vanishes outside of a coupling zone. So the coupling is really only active inside of this uh, compact coupling zone here. And then we also have a coupling strength, uh, lambda. 
Good. So um, when uh, when we talk generally about about probes, we of course immediately uh, face the uh, the problem that um, the whole probe field just has too many degrees of freedom. Yeah. So when we look at the at the scalar probe field from before, it just has infinite uh, degrees of freedom. So uh, well, infinitely many. So what can you do, right? So the idea is that maybe we can restrict to a particular degree of freedom of this probe field, a particular accessible degree of freedom. And I want to talk about this now. So the setup is in some sense easy as before, we couple the probe to the system in some coupling zone, and then we choose a processing region, okay, given by this region here and the, the, the shaded blue region here. Um, the idea is that in the processing region, our agent will um, perform a measurement of the probe, will read out uh, some pointer value of a uh, measurement device or something, will just process the information accessible to the agent. And that will happen in this uh, region. And this region is, um, well, um, reasonably taken to be a finite region. Um, if I read off, uh, a value of an experimental device, this happens in a finite region. Okay, so um, now if we would choose still all local degrees of freedom in the processing region, this would still be overwhelming. So what do we do? And the idea is we want to restrict to just one degree of freedom, that is one local bosonic mode in this processing region. So how do we do this? We choose smearing functions, real valued um, compactly supported smooth functions, F1 and F2, with support inside this processing region, such that the associated smeared out fields will fulfill the canonical commutation relations. And then I can use suggestive notation, I, call, I can look at, um, at Q and P at quadrature operators. Um, and uh, I can also look at the associated annihilation operator, and of course also the associated um, creation operator. And then I can look at the algebra generated by P and Q, which is then if you want a local harmonic oscillator, it will be a local kinematical harmonic oscillator. And this local bosonic mode will be uh, our model for a local particle detector. So just uh, to be clear, um, this is really just one accessible degree of freedom of a local theory, a local um, particle detector. Okay, so uh, let us also informal informal five minute warning. You know how it works. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, so let us talk about the preparation states because this is also important. How can we prepare our local particle detectors? And here we are restricted because the local particle detectors that the initial states of the local particle detectors um, need to be restrictions of states, of physically reasonable states of the whole probe field. So um, we need to assume that the whole probe field is in a physically reasonable state, then we restrict this whole state of the probe field to our local particle detector, to our local bosonic mode, and we get an initial preparation state of our local particle detector. And as we heard before, Reich leader state uh, form a, a large class of physically reasonable preparation states. Yeah? Um, and uh, if, you, if you look at this more closely, you can actually see that if your field, if your scalar field is in a ratio leader state, then you see that your local mode, so your local particle detector is always in a mixed state. Even more, if uh, your field is in a quasi-free ratio leader state, for instance, a ground state or a KMS, a thermal state, um, then your local mode is also in a quasi-free mixed state. You cannot evade that. So those are the preparation states for local particle detectors. Good, so uh, we're done diving in. Um, we talked uh, about the fact that at least for uh, a certain class of um, physically reasonable states, your, our local particle detectors will always be prepared in a mixed state. Okay, so now the last part, let us actually do some entanglement harvesting, okay? Uh, and for that, we first need to talk about, um, well, uh, the, uh, we need to talk about the setup. So we have, um, 
now two local particle detectors, okay? And the setup is in some sense uh, very easy. So instead of having, so we always have the system. And now instead of having one probe fields, well, we have two scalar probe fields. Each of them are coupled to, with the same bilinear coupling are coupled to the system field. Um, field A is for Alice is coupled in this blue region. Field B is coupled in this red region. And then will process her probe field phi A in this blue region, and Bob will process his region, uh, his probe field um, in this uh, red processing region. So then the, uh, the particle detector will actually be in here um, for Alice and in the red shaded region for Bob. So now let us quickly talk about the, um, the effect of the interaction, right? Because um, Contrary to what uh, Chris was interested in when he told us about state updates of the system, we are interested in if you want state updates of um, the probe in a sense that we want to start with our, we want to prepare our local particle detectors, we want to um, couple them to the system, then we want to look at the updated state, which is exactly what happens here. So we start with system and probe, so the whole probe field. Um, all three theories initially prepared in quasi-free Reich leader states which especially means that the local modes, the local particle detectors will be in quasi-free mixed states. Then we let them interact. We trace out the system because we're interested in the probes. And then we further restrict the probes to the local modes, one in each of these processing regions. And then what we get is we get uh, on the combination of the two local modes, we get a quasi-free state for every coupling constant lambda, for every coupling strength. Okay, and now let us investigate the entanglement of this quasi-free state. And here we have an advantage that the entanglement of quasi-free states is very well understood, especially on the combination of uh, two bosonic modes. Um, so the quasi-free uh, quasi states on two bosonic modes are entangled if and only if they do not have a positive partial transpose. So without going further into detail what that means, it's basically sufficient for us that we know that this can be characterized by a scalar function P, a function of the covariance that is in some sense related to the negativity that maybe some of you know, but um, it, is, um, it, it is actually just, this P is just a polynomial of the entries of the covariance matrix. So it's easier to handle than the negativity which involves traces and um, sorry, which involves um, square roots and quotients and stuff like that. And in terms of this scalar function, um, we can characterize quasi-free states on two bosonic modes. If this P is small or equal zero, the state is separable. If this P is strictly positive, the state is entangled. And now if you want the um, grand finale, as we talked before, for every coupling strength lambda, we get P of lambda which characterizes the final state of the two local particle detectors at coupling lambda, okay? So clearly, if uh, we do not have any coupling at all, we have the situation of the um, uh, initial states, right? I mean, if we do not have any interaction, the initial state, well, the final state will be the initial state. And the initial state was assumed to be not entangled. It was basically just a tensor product of the initial states. In particular, P of zero is separable, so it's small or equal zero. Okay, um, now let us investigate this further. We can actually see that P of zero is zero if and only if the initial state of at least one local detector is pure. But as we talked uh, about before, if the fields are prepared in Reich leader states, then you cannot prepare the local particle detectors in a pure state. In particular, that means that P of zero is strictly negative. And then continuity of P at lambda equals zero shows that even if I go a little bit around lambda equals zero, my P of lambda would still be smaller equals zero. So for small coupling, I will still have that my P lambda will be smaller equals zero. But what does that mean? It means that the updated state at small coupling will not be entangled. Okay, so um, I'm, uh, I'm running a bit over time. I'm sorry, but uh, here is again the, the outline. So um, 
maybe I'll, I'll use this to, to give a short summary. So, um, well, we talked about uh, entanglement harvesting non-relativistic detectors with either singular or non-local coupling have been used to show that one can actually harvest entanglement. And interestingly enough, um, you can show that you can harvest entanglement independent of the coupling strength, at least to um, certain order in perturbation theory. Now, uh, in order to avoid these imperfections, we use um, local particle detectors instead. But unfortunately, physically reasonably, they can only be prepared in mixed states. And now the, the insight is that, well, it is hard to entangle uncorrelated modes in mixed states. And this results in a coupling strength threshold for entanglement harvesting, meaning that if your entanglement, if, if, if your coupling strength is below a certain critical coupling, then your local particle detectors cannot get entangled. And let me finish with a discussion and outlook. So um, those are just some interesting open questions and um, some interesting points worth discussing. So first of all, first of all, of course, one could ask how realistic is a probe field? And um, you could you could take the pragmatic point of view, and you could say, well, um, um, this is really just this should be seen as a proxy for a truly local um, measurement device. You know, the, a scalar probe field is um, possibly the simplest uh, local quantum field that you could write down. So it should be seen as a proxy for that. But still, one could ask, is is this a good proxy for a truly local measurement device? And then the second thing, are local bosonic modes really good degrees of freedom? Are they accessible? Can you really access such a, a local bosonic mode? Which is an, an interesting question. And again, of course, the motivation to choose them is they're very simple and they're very similar to harmonic oscillator detectors. How mixed are the initial states of the local bosonic modes, which is related to how big is this coupling strength threshold? related to can local particle detectors harvest entanglement at higher coupling strength? Can they harvest entanglement at all? And maybe the last question that you could also ask is, how big is this threshold um, in the case of quantum mechanical detectors um, if the initial states are mixed quasi-free states? And with those, uh, well, questions, I would like to thank you for your attention and apologize for going over time. Thank you, Max. All right. Thank you on behalf of everybody. There are, uh, there are two questions on the queue. One, Don Page, and I'm going to let go first, and then uh, uh, Rick. So, Don, I'm going to let you unmute yourself. You can unmute yourself now, Don. Go ahead, and then still can. Okay. Yeah. No, I, th th this is just a background question I don't know the answer to. So, suppose you just simply have a, like a massive free scalar field in flat space time and you have these two causal these two causally separated regions and they're they're physically separated by a positive uh spatial gap just the, is just the vacuum state does it have correlations between these two regions i mean because of this yes you know, this, yes so it, it, it so it, yeah so it's not i mean it's of course there's quantum correlations but there really is there really is entanglement that's that's and does that then that I mean, suppose the two regions have a certain size, uh, well, certain size A, for example, but they're separated by a distance B that's much bigger than A. Or is it still, no matter how far apart they are, that there's still there's still entanglement between the, the two regions? There will always be entanglement between these regions, no matter how big they are, no matter how far away they are. Um, um, if they're space like separated, and uh, well, of course, you, if you want, you, you could think about very unphysical states in which you would not have entanglement, uh, possibly. But, but, but um, it's really suppressed if it's a massive field with a distance. So what Don is saying, if the distance is really good, entanglement dies very fast, always non-zero, but exponentially suppressed. Right, but okay, but it doesn't, it, 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 it's, not, it's not like just if you have two, like two harmonic oscillators, okay, they can, they can be, they could be in a mixed state that has quantum correlations, but it's not. But the correlations are not enough, in some sense, to, to make them entangled. In this, in this sense, that it's not entangled in the sense that it's not a sum with positive coefficients of, of product states. 
I mean, in other words, for harmonic oscillators, as I understand, or just or just finite state systems, it, it's it, it's a stronger requirement that they be entangled than that they than that they be correlated. But you're saying that the, the, even the stronger requirement works for in the quantum so, field theory, and no matter what the separation is. So I'm okay. So um, I, I'm not talking about quantifying the entanglement, but um, they will always be entangled. So the um, the observable algebra in this zone A and the observable algebra in this zone B. Um, if you look at at the state and you restrict it to this algebra to this algebra here, the state will always show entanglement, not just correlation, but entanglement. Yes, no okay. matter how big they are, no matter how far away they are. Yeah. If okay. You thank to, you. That's, yeah. I'm not an expert in this subject. That, that was yeah. a, a, a yeah. sort of a gap in my knowledge. So thanks for filling it in. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Max. Uh, so next in the queue is uh, Rick. Actually, Rick, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks for the, the presentation. It was very interesting to see this this model. Uh, uh, and actually, the question that I have is regarding uh, the model itself, even before talking about entanglement. So the you use this quantum field to be the, the probe, right? To act as this local probe. But the thing is that whenever you're talking about a quantum field theory, the quantum field theory is something defined. I mean, it's an algebra defined on space time. And then you can talk about states and things like this. So, uh, I mean, how do you actually implement the localization of the quantum field, of the, the probe, given that, like, on this setup? Uh, I think that this was not clear for me. How to implement the localization of the probe? Okay, so the, the so maybe here, so the probe itself um, is taken to be a, a whole quantum field, okay? So the full probe is, um, if you want a, a fully local theory here um, sketched by um, a, a scalar field phi a, a real scalar field, okay, with uh, this free dynamics itself, okay? And um, now uh, what I, what, well, if you want, there are two kinds of localization here. The first localization is where I couple this uh, thing to, to the system of interest, this scalar field. Okay, and this will be some, well, some highly sophisticated um, experimental setup where I, uh, I couple them together in this coupling zone. And then there's the second region, if you want, this is this uh, processing region where then I um, read off some point of value of some measurement device, or in other words, I, I access this, um, this one degree of freedom that I'm interested in of this, um, of this whole field. And how I do this is, um, is, uh, is described here. So I, I, I look at, uh, if you want, I look at, well, I look at the local mode of this, um, of this field. I unfortunately cannot take uh, in, in, in flat space, I mean, Kofsky or so, right? You have the standard annihilation and creation operator that will, um, well, they, they will, um, they, they will uh, create a, a, a sharp mode in momentum space, but unfortunately, they cannot be localized in, in a finite region. So in some sense, they are not suited for that because they are not, they are not accessible. Um, this is the idea. So you, you choose a, a, a local mode and by that you basically smear your phi against a compactly supported function. So would you say that your, your particle detector model there is a localized particle detector model, although it is described by this, this whole quantum field? Oh, definitely, yes, yeah. Okay. Yes, right. in the right. sense that if, if you want the, um, the, the internal dynamics of this particle detector model is more complicated because it's not just a quantum field on just a real line, if you want. It's not the quantum mechanical system. The internal dynamics is more complicated because it's actually the whole probe is a whole quantum field. But, um, but that, that extends itself to the whole of space time in the end, right? Like when you, when you put the Klein Gordon equation, the modes of solutions that you have to actually pick there, and the, the Hilbert space that, that spans the, the the quantum, the thing that will later be promoted to the to the Hilbert space representation or whatever, all of these things are are extremely not localized, right? That is where I see some some. That, that's my problem essentially. I see a lot of. Okay, non well localized then, things that are being used to talk about the detector. Okay, but I think maybe, it, uh, I just have to look at it more carefully later. I think maybe let me be provocative and let me ask you what what constitutes a local uh, well 
detect the model. What, what do you mean by local there? Well, if you talk about a harmonic oscillator, for example, or an atom or something like this, uh, these, which are the things that are defined in the real line of the, the usual particle detector models that we use, mm -hmm. these are localized by an external potential or something like this, right? Exactly because they're not attempting to be a, a fundamental description. So, well, but yeah. if, if you want, the, the only thing in, in, well, if you allow me that point of view, the only thing that then really matters is how you couple it to the, to the system and that is done in a compact coupling zone. So local in that sense, that it's actually in, in, in a finite region. Okay, okay. I mean, the coupling is local, I get that, but I wouldn't say that the detector itself is local in this description, you see? But it's, it's a matter of, of uh, the work you're using. Maybe it's a matter end. of terminology, right? It, it's exactly, a local quantum exactly. field theory, but... Um... Sorry, Greg, let's, uh, let's move to the next, uh, because there are three people we're not Oh, no, yes, for sure. I, I, I'm satisfied. Thank you so I much saw, for that. I saw Silke, Silke consulting with collaborators <laughs> in the video. So Silke, the <laughs> floor is yours. Sorry, okay. Um, no. I'm not quite sure about your comment. I didn't quite understand oh, it. Oh, because but I, saw, I saw your... Ah, daughter. yeah, 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 my daughter. My daughter. <laughs> okay, you know, okay, but yeah. Um, yeah, it's an interesting, uh, a very interesting subject, as um, I mentioned before. So one of the things that puzzles me here a little bit is, so if one field is your auxiliary field to probe uh, the, the field of interest, right? And if you couple strongly to it, then you have other issues. This is a quant you, you want to learn about a quantum system and you use an auxiliary field to get this information. But if you interact strongly with this quantum field, you're changing the quantum field. So this is where, where I'm a bit puzzled here, what, um, what the terminology weak and strong means. So uh, maybe you could comment on that because you, know, you don't want to change the quantum system a lot. Right? You want to learn about it with a minimum influence. If you couple strongly, you are in the other regime. Either. I would say there are uh, two points to this question. So the first one is if we are in, uh, in the setting that, that Chris talked about, where we use these local probes to learn something about the system, then we are in this situation that, uh, well, we have the probe, we have the system, we want to learn something from the system and um, there you could argue whether you want the probe itself to disturb the system a lot or not. But um, there you, um, you can keep in mind that um, what we are interested in is the, if you want, is the system itself. And then we have the, um, then we have the, the actual physical situation where the, the system itself does not exist but there is just the, the couple theory of the system and the probe. And there, in, in my opinion, um, you, you do not need to talk about the, the coupling between the probe and the system to be weak or strong in, uh, in a certain way. Yeah, but isn't this then, isn't in, this in, then just a normal, so this is what I'm saying, if you're going away from this scheme, isn't it just a normal way how people entang entangling? So, I mean, for me, this is then kind of, um, why is this, these are two interacting systems, they, they interact strongly and you can entangle them. So we're in the realm of, of, of quantum mechanics. Now you're doing this with relativistic fields. Um, it's just that then I don't see why one would be the detector and, and the other, the, the you know, the field. It's just you're promoting the fields both on the same level. You just have well, two interacting it, relativistic fields. Well, fair enough. But at, at this point, I, I want the system actually to, to have a, um, well, a non-trivial effect on the probes. I want the system to entangle my probes. So I, I do want that it has um, um, an effect on, on the probes and entangle them. And I think the, the main point here is that um, if, uh, if you are in this framework that I, that I talked about, then if you do this at uh, weak coupling, you, uh, you will not see that your, your local particle detectors will get entangled. In, in some sense, if you allow me, that is the statement I, I make. 
and uh, and I do not speculate about the the meaning of 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 taking higher coupling or or going to a strong coupling regime or so, not necessarily at least. Okay. What is I mean, if just in one sentence? What is exactly the scale when you say strong and weak? Is there a physics intuition or a physical result when? When are they strongly or weakly coupling with respect to some parameters of the two systems? That is an open question. So um, by um, weak, I mean um, so weak. Well, it, it's in some sense it's it's circular. Yeah. So uh, by by weak here, I mean uh, in a neighborhood around zero coupling, and that can be quite small. And the question is, an open question is, um, well, how big does your coupling have to be such that you can actually overcome this threshold and you can actually entangle? And uh, that is a very interesting question. And uh, unfortunately, uh, you would have to tackle this uh, numerically. And then you um, have the problem that the internal dynamics of the probe field comes into play, which is um, admittedly harder to, to, to treat than uh, the internal dynamics of the harmonic oscillator, for instance. But uh, yes, yeah, so this is a question. Um, how, how weak is weak and how strong is strong in, in this terminology here? Okay, are you satisfied? With the answer? Well, I just think I, it's not quite, these are two quantum systems. You probably consider them at zero temperature each. There are two interacting quantum systems, even if the interaction is very small. I, I don't know, I'm, I don't know enough about it, but I really want a, such a weak regime, really. But this is a long discussion. It's a very interesting project. You know, I mean, I'm, I think it's quite exciting. It's just um, because there are all these open questions. I, I, I agree, definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Silke. Uh, okay, next person uh, on the queue is, uh, is Rob, Rob Mann. Uh, Rob, uh, you can mute yourself, yeah. Yeah, hi, thanks. It's an interesting talk. I mean, it's uh, obviously going to be, um, <clears throat> cause people that work in this area to think about it, but, but it's predicated on ruling out for reasons that you claim are non-relativistic, these two level and multiple level detectors. So, um, although I could ask a number of things, some of them have been asked, uh, doesn't that mean that these detectors should be ruled out for everything people have considered for the same rationale? I mean, it doesn't matter if you've got, if you're worried about entanglement, presumably one should never really consider uh, single UD two level UDW detectors and so on for the same reasons. Would you agree with that? Um, well, so there are two points. If, if you want to be very strict and, and, and very fundamental, then, um, well, you should not couple non-relativistic systems to a quantum field because you get singular or non-local equations of motion, and this is unphysical. Um, the other question is, well, um, okay, good. Fundamentally, in principle, this is the case, but um, up to, um, well, a very high precision, it doesn't matter, right? So also this is uh, referring to the last talk that we heard. Um, they are, they are if, if you care about uh, impossible measurements and you're worried, then it tells you, well, up to a very, um, up, up to a certain precision or so, um, they are still uh, very good uh, detector models, these non-relativistic, these uh, Unruh-David detector type models are still very good and uh, not the problem. Um, so, so then, so then, by the same token, since the, uh, the entanglement harvesting work is with these kinds of detectors, as is the demonstration of the Unruh effect, um, presumably they are basically okay. Uh, if that's what I thought you just said, I mean, uh, based on the previous talk as well. Yes. Of course, but, so, uh, so it. Um... I guess and they this, can ha harvest entanglement. Well, right? yes, I, so I guess this I'm a bit confused as to the status of this. So, I guess it uh, 
it depends on your attitude. If you view a UNRU DeWitt detector as a, an approximation for a truly local measurement device that could be modeled the way I model this, then what I talked about um, could um, raise the question whether you should maybe look at uh, different initial states of your quantum mechanical harmonic oscillator detectors. Just because the model that you try to approximate by these non-relativistic systems, um, these local particle detector models are typically always in a mixed initial state. So it could be that uh, despite the fact that those uh, quantum mechanical, that those UNRU DeWitt detector type models are very good um, approximations, it could just be that you could make them way more realistic if you would choose um, a mixed quasi-free state as an initial state. This is, of course, if you if you adopt the, the idea that, well, um, what these local particle detector models that I talked about are good or are, are good models for some uh, fundamental description of, uh, of, of a truly local measurement device. So, um, this is well, but well, sure, but it does uh, rest on the question of the quote, if you believe. And, and I mean, I guess that is my question. I, it seems Fair to me enough. the question your talk actually raises is to what extent we can trust anything we've learned in the last four decades that have made use of the UDW type device. Well, because. I, I well, it's the question is there because you've ruled it out of bounds for this discussion. So then I would ask, where is it out of bounds and, and on what circumstances is it not out of bounds? So, so it may, it may, I may say something really quick. There is a, sure. a it's related to, to what Robbie's saying and what Max is responding. So Max, if I were to play devil's advocate, I would say, uh, okay, if I want to choose an initial state for an with detector, so there are papers out there that prove that under with detectors are really, really good descriptions for light matter interaction. So like you get a system of proton electron that is bound, of course, not relativistic, but all the quantum mechanics can be matched and not only matched theoretically, but experiments to a, an immense degree of, of precision, right? So uh, if I want to inform myself of what the initial state, I would ask an atomic physicist and I would ask them, can you really prepare the ground state? And they would tell you, yeah, yeah, we have methods to prepare the ground state to a fidelity of, uh, you know, one minus 10 to the minus nine. So the argument of choosing a mixed, I think it's super interesting to ask, okay, let's do entanglement harvesting with mixed states and see if we have this critical coupling as well or not. That's interesting in its own right. But I'm not entirely convinced whether this would inform me to choose a, by first principles a good initial state because the fact is that there are experiments, real experiments that I can ask people, can you do them in the lab? And they have um, localized systems or to good approximation localized systems for which the Andrew DeWitt model is really a good approximation. And they, they claim they can prepare down states and everything seems compatible. So again, there's an equilibrium. I, I don't expect an answer. It's kind of interesting to raise these questions, but I still am skeptical about the, you should prepare a mixed state instead, a non, a non pure uh, uh, Gaussian state as an initial state. Yeah. No, definitely. If you, uh, if you allow me, maybe. Um, so what do I want to say? Um, at, at least if you, uh, Again, right? Um, if you if you believe that um, modeling uh, this situation with a quantum field, and if if you um, if you believe that um, a local mode is um, uh, the, the the actual degree of uh, of freedom that that we that we access, then um, well, this um, this tells you that uh, well, if, if if the whole field is in a uh, physically reasonable state, then the initial state will be mixed. Okay? But then again, so I so get again, that. It will be a local mode of a theory that you present. In, in reality, we'd have a local mode of a very, very interactive theory that gets bound states, <laughs> right? So maybe under the simple assumptions that you have for your field, that is kind of a free field that only couples, then yes. But I would say that in reality, personally, I would say an atom as an effective description, it's probably a better effective description than a free field. If you had a field that is interactive, and then therefore you're, there are bound states and they say, okay, the bound states are the right states to, to consider a detector, a localized bound state. Then I will tell you, no doubt, you definitely got the upper hand. 
But if you're saying a state of a free field that only couples, and I consider a localized mode, that mode is very unphysical, I would argue. It's, it's spreads in time. <laughs> it's not contained. The relativistic, that, that thing is going to become infinitely localized in time to the mode that is measurement, measuring. I would argue that that's that, right? I mean, um, I wouldn't say that a mode of a free field is more realistic than an effective atom, personally. But again, uh, this is, um, and, and I'm sorry, because I'm into much. There are many people uh, waiting to ask, uh, is it okay if I, if I invite the next person to ask masks? Yes. I think it's Thank a great, you. by Thank the way, you. great work. I'm enjoying it very, very thoroughly. Uh, the next person in the in line was uh, Albert Rauda. Albert. Thank sorry. you. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, interesting talk, Maximilian. So I have two short questions that are related somehow to already some of the previous ones. Uh, the first one, it seems to me that the key aspect here, of course, is that you're claiming that uh, this probe that you're using in this uh, bound region or this bound mode that you're referring to, that is in a, in, in a mixed state uh, initially. That seems to be a key point uh, for, the final, for the final conclusion. So one of the questions is, um, you know, if I want to have a simple intuitive understanding of this, is it correct to think that the reason for that is that uh, since you are trying to localize it in a region in space-time, precisely because the, the probe field itself will be entangled with other modes outside that region of the probe field itself. Uh, that's, the, that's one of the, that's the roughly speaking the intuitive reason of why you have here a mixed state. Because when you start with your probe field, before even it interacts with the system, uh, because of this entanglement with the other regions of space-time, it, it will be in a mixed state. And if that is a correct intuitive understanding of the reason for that, then the idea would be, okay, so if I want to have a good probe that uh, minimizes this effect we are discussing as much as possible, I would want to have something that entangles as little as possible, you know, in the region, given the region that I'm considering. And that might be with Don's initial question. For example, I want to use a massive feeling of and so on, so that the entanglement, you know, with the rest of space time and so on uh, is, is small. And I try to minimize how mix this initial state is. So that would be one point. And then the second question based on that and, and, and connect it also a little bit with uh, maybe Silke's uh, questions and remarks. If you try to minimize that as much as possible, then yes, your theorem would still, would still say that you will have a lower bound on lambda, which would be not zero, but it could be a very small value so that for many of the discussions, you know, practical ones, or even the discussion of whether you are not perturbing so much the system anyway, and so on and so forth. I mean, you, you prove mathematically that you will always have a lower bound, which is positive, but it could be very small for practical purposes. And it seems that one way to try to minimize that is along the lines of the first question, try to minimize the entanglement of this uh, local mode uh, with the with with the rest of space time, as far as the probe is concerned. So, do do you do you agree with these uh, thoughts? I agree very much. Yes. So, it, in in some sense, what this shows you is that you want to minimize the mixedness of the initial states, right? Exactly. And if you want, yeah. this could be um, well, this this could be the mathematical analog of uh, a careful preparation of your uh, measurement device, of your experimental, right. a careful preparation of your experimental setup. Right. So I, I very much agree, yeah. Um, this is also the reason why I think it, it would be interesting to, to investigate, um, well, to, to answer this question, how big is the coupling strength threshold typically, right? Mm -hmm, is, it, mm -hmm. is it very small, you know, can you, well, effectively you can always prepare the initial uh, state in, in a state that of course, yeah, it, it, it might be mixed, but effectively it's pure, so we don't care. And even at a relatively weak coupling, still coupling, a but still relatively weak coupling where maybe perturbation theory still holds and everything is still nice. You can entangle everything and, um, and, and everything works. Um, right, right, right. So, so that's why- un Until you investigate this, I think uh, this, uh, well, I, I think th this, at least this raises uh, the question or the motivation to, to have a look at this. Right, right. And I think somehow along the lines of the first question, uh, trying to minimize the entanglement of your uh, local boat with the rest of uh, with the field itself uh, outside that space and region might be one one of the natural questions to try to find how to minimize uh, this initial mixing, which is then the, the key aspect. It seems. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Albert. There's uh, so many questions. It's good. I'm going to try. I'm going to ask the questionnaires because there's some of them in the second round. I'm going to ask them to keep it brief if possible. I know that it's not easy to, to say. Uh, the next person in the in line was Jorma, although Chris also has, uh, you have your, your hand up. I think you may have, if you want, privilege of co-authorship. If you want to clarify something, if you want to use it, I'll give it to you, Chris. Thank you very much. Actually, I'm not a co-author on this, but uh, as, as a supervisor, um, I think that one of the interesting questions that what Ma Maximilian's results present is where, what is the role of perturbation theory in the Unruh DeWitt detector? Yeah. So the thermalization of the Unruh DeWitt detector does not actually depend on perturbation theory, though it's often demonstrated using perturbation theory. Uh, Maximilian's answer uh, result perhaps shows, at least in this model of a detector, that uh, entanglement harvesting might have to be regarded as a non-perturbative effect, because in the very weakest coupling zone, uh, something uh, you, do, you do not see this entang the uh, harvesting. Uh, that's all I want to say. I'll, I'll shut up now. Right. I, I would say quickly, there are, uh, this has been non-perturbative harvesting is something that has been studied with detectors, and it does happen. In fact, if the, if the coupling strength is too strong, it becomes uh, not possible to to extract entanglement outside the, the the because of noise. But that's a different question to study. And I think the initial state, though, Max, I don't know what you think. The initial state here is key, no? In fact, this makes sense. Right. There is um, the next person in line uh, would be uh, have I lost the thing? It's Harris. Harris is the next person. Oh no, Jorma, my bad. Jorma and Harris. Jorma, you're next. Yeah. Thank you. Very nice. So uh, to clarify, the results that you've shown today, were they obtained within perturbation theory or are they non-perturbative? Um, so if you want, they, the result is that, um, that for, uh, for small coupling, you cannot harvest entanglement, that, but the argument itself is, uh, is fully non-perturbative for this model which uh, relies on the fact basically that you can, uh, that you can solve this model um, non-perturbatively. Whether it's explicitly solved is of course a different question, but in principle, th this bilinear coupling is, can be solved explicitly. So this argument here is a fully non-perturbative argument applied to weak coupling, if you want. Thank you. Right. Uh, the next person is Haris. Uh, also, I hope that you, uh, not to mad at me, <laughs> Haris, this is the next question. The next, the next uh, speaker does not mind, I think. Perfect. <laughs> so I just want to make a clarification based partly on what Eduardo said. Uh, I think when we talk about the detector, we should specify what we mean. If the detector is not a Right, the Unruh de Witt coupling, or at least its equivalent in electrodynamics, is derived, is derived from QED. Mm -hmm. What is missing are some terms, of course, because this is supposed to be dipole coupling approximation. So this is derived from first principles if some terms are small. So if we think of it as, as a macroscopic detector, like a photo detector, then well, then this has to do with what is the pointer variable, how you would go on to model, uh, for example, photocurrents, right? This is the pointer variable in a, an actual detector. So this is a completely different question, but I, uh, what has to do with the accuracy of the modeling. But as, if you want to describe atoms and harvesting refers to atoms, I think we can safely say that this is an approximate description that is derived from QFT. That's a general remark, nothing else. Thank you, Faris. Uh, Max, do you want to say something or next person can go? Thanks for the remark. Right. All right. Uh, so this is second round, people. So keep it, uh, keep it as, as short as possible. We have uh, in order of raising hands done and then Silke. Okay, I, I was just going to make the point that, that it turned out that Albert made that maybe the mix of this could be so small that the critical coupling constant could just be it could just be very small. But Albert made it better than I could have. All right, thank you, Don. Thank you. And then uh, Silka. 
Okay, so here's, here are my thoughts about this. And it's just so in the analog gravity system where I said we have a, a setup like that, the way we can achieve this locality here, because you know, you have a free field into it's being your detector. Per definition, it's non-local. If you, if you want to constrain your free, free field on a small reach and the energy levels get gapped again and it becomes a detector. So a local detector. So having these free fields. So how do you how do you make the interaction local? This is to be honest. How can you switch off interaction but have it on on one point? This is the obstacle I see that needs to be overcome conceptually. And in the analogs we cheat because or we use the fact that you can uh, work with lower dimensional systems. So you have a two plus one dimensional uh, analog gravity system. So your relativistic field theory is a sheet of uh, of atoms which form this superfluid. And your detector is perpendicular. Your electromagnetic field, your wave, is um, uh, is is perpendicular to it. So then you have local up to the size of the laser beam. You have a local region of interaction. So and this here, this I think is if I look at this, this is the conceptual thing which um, is postulated that you can have a local interaction, but no solution of how something like this could be achieved was presented. And I think this. In just looking at that is the biggest um, obstacle to overcome, I would say, to make these viable detectors. Uh, do I see this right or wrong? Um, I must, okay, I, I see your point, but uh, I will have to think a little bit more about that, for sure. Also, um, so going back to, to your initial point where you basically say that, uh, well, you take a free field, it's, um, it's completely delocalized and then you put it in a cavity. Um, becomes a, 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 then it's a standard detector, right? It depends how, how small your, your cavity well, yeah, is. It, it, it will depend on, on, on your boundary condition and you will, I mean, you will choose, okay, if you want you, so you, you impose boundary conditions to your quantum field and it will not be the, the, the free field. Um, I, I see that that is the point that, uh, that you're making. I'm not but, saying uh, that it's not possible, but I'm saying that, but just comparing it to what we have done with Yoma and Bill yeah. and why it works, yeah. why this exactly yeah. works in the analogs is because yeah. we can make the, the, the two fields, sorry, we can make the two fields uh, orthogonal to each other. Okay, and, but, but and so then, that, that's why you can do it. But okay, but then let me, um, okay. Let me let me ask you the, the following question. So um, I, I see that uh, that the point of, of, of criticism here is that this local mode is maybe not really um, accessible. Is that the point? So do you? Okay. So if if we agree on the fact that the coupling might be um, okay for the sake of, of the argument now, and the accessibility of this one local mode is is uh, is the problem then um so then i would have something to say is okay so let's let's you yes let's use as a working hypothesis that um this coupling between the probe field and the system field in this compact coupling zone is okay so then uh um, is what you're saying that uh, you do not have access to a local mode of of the probe field no at a point you want to interact at a point right um, well you want to measure you want to interact or get information about your quantum field theory locally at a point if you want to make this as a, an under i'm just i'm not actually it's not a critics it is a, a, a you know i'm just saying maybe one has to completely change the way mm. we're thinking about this and something more needs to change but i'd say from comparing this because as i'm saying this is extremely relevant with the stuff we're doing for this analog gravity systems and so it, it is a relevant it is it is something you know that has already some in my opinion of you know of, um there are there, there, there could be i think there are physical systems where this kind of thoughts are applicable but they are lower dimensional uh, dimensional and they have this trick. If that's not there, right, how could you make this more generally applicable going away from these analogs if both the probe and the auxiliary field are three plus one dimensional field theories? Um, and I'm not saying it doesn't work, I'm just saying 
that this is something that is an interesting question and perhaps there could be a different way of approaching the problem. It's not the critics, it's just something I point out which is an interesting question to address. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, so the first thing is that um, maybe so when, when I talk about local interaction, I do not necessarily mean interaction at a point. So never actually, right? So the, the interaction is confined in a compact coupling zone that is extended and is in some sense necessarily extended. So not just along a world line, but it's, it's necessarily extended um, in, in order to, to, to maintain this, uh, this, this locality, at least, um, or let's, let's use the other way around. Uh, we see that we have problems with uh, the, the locality um, of, the, of the couple theory if we couple um, at points, well, at points we have problems with the singularity, and if we couple along world lines or so, uh, we have problems with, um, um, so if we smear them out with problems with locality. Um, so the, 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 the locality notion here is really that the, that the coupled theory itself is, um, is, is a local quantum field theory. Um, and the, the, the important, it, it's not the case that we talk about coupling that happens at a point. I don't know if I maybe misunderstand. But it's localized. That's what here. I mean. It's localized in a in a in a in a volume. In a, it is a localized in a region. In yes. A region. Yes. Okay. Yes. So um, and 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 for that, uh, I I very much like the, um, the the picture that 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 Chris showed. And uh, so well, of course, it, it it coined my way of thinking about it, where um, he he gave this example of how you can think of uh, coupling. Uh, two fields together in a certain uh, coupling zone where you have uh, auxiliary fields that you tune and then you will get an, an effective coupling in a in a compact coupling zone. So um, I, uh, I like this idea of, of, of um, well, of giving a, a possible answer to the question, well, how can you write down a, or how could you engineer such a, a coupling between two fields, maybe even effectively? All right, I think probably we should leave it uh, here. Uh, it's, been, it's been great. Uh, Max, uh, thank you again on behalf of everybody. This was, let, let me just tell you, this was a great talk. Also, sorry I assigned uh, collaborators to your, <laughs> to your project. I've seen Chris's name on the, on the presentation threw me off. Really, really great talk. The kind of talk that uh, elicits this discussion is probably the best kind of talk there is. So really thoroughly enjoy it. Thank you so much. All right, we're going to move to the next speaker. So I'm going to pause the recording while Haris said. Mm -hmm. All right, our next speaker today is Haris Anastopoulos uh, uh, from the University of Patras. And uh, he's going to talk about entanglement and other gravity induced effects from quantum matter, a first principles analysis. Exciting title. The floor is yours. Yes. Right. Thank you, Eduardo. I would like to thank the organizers for giving the opportunity to give this talk and for organizing this event at these times. Uh, let's hope we get together and give the talks in person soon. So I'm going to talk about the work in progress with my collaborators, Michalis Lagovardos and Dina Savidu, which is to do a, let's say, first principles analysis of Newtonian gravity, but for quantum systems. Now, what is the motivation? The motivation is that we are close to having experiments to see uh, the gravitational effect from macroscopic quantum systems. And we want to understand it better in relation to general relativity. And so, what would be a quantum theory for this, macros for this gravitation of macroscopic quantum systems? There is an obvious answer, but there are some many complications which, and this is the reason why we should be very careful and start from the very, very beginning. Essentially, general relativity linearized. Now, let me give the background. Of course, you know that we have the conflict between quantum theory and general relativity at many levels. 
there are programs for quantum gravity. But in recent years, there is a different regime, the regime of gravitational quantum physics, as it is being called, where we can probe not towards the Planck length, but towards long scale phenomena, macroscopic scale phenomena in macroscopic quantum systems. Well, can gravitational quantum physics say something new about gravity or quantum gravity? There are certainly claims. Let me remind you that the first experiment of gravitational quantum physics is the famous Colel over Hauser Werner experiment, where essentially they showed that a background gravitational field can be described in terms of a potential term in the Hamiltonian, in the quantum Hamiltonian of a particle. Now, we want to go one level beyond that, not in a classical background field, but to talk about the gravitational force generated by the quantum distribution of matter, whatever, however we define force, and of course the gravitational interaction between different distributions. And we want, we are working at weak gravity limit, the experiments are mostly going to be at non-relativistic velocity, so this is essentially Newton, the, the regime of Newtonian gravity. Now, if we did not know general relativity, well, in a sense, even if we know general relativity, what we expect is that the gravitational potential is obtained as a solution of the Poisson equation. So it's not an independent degree of freedom. If you know the mass density, you know phi, and if you know the mass density with a hat, meaning a quantum density, we know phi with a hat. So the natural assumption is that the same property holds also in quantum theory. So the gravitational potential is just an auxiliary operator, not a true degree of freedom. And if you have a, a appropriately regularized mass density operator, you can define a non-local term in the Hamiltonian for a non-relativistic QFT like the QFTs we have in condensed matter. So this expectation should be borne out. Now, the first discussion of the gravitational field from quantum matter, in particular, uh, cut states of matter was made by Roger Penrose. Penrose wanted to avoid this. And that's why he's, he, in, he found some paradoxes. We are going to discuss about them in the notion of a macroscopic superposition of mass densities. And he proposed the mechanism, well, an idea of gravitational decoherence or gravitational state reduction. Uh, after that, uh, it was the work of Baylock and I, we, we thought the opposite uh, towards the opposite direction, not kill the cut states, but actually try to see and whether these cut states generated by macroscopic superpositions can be analyzed and have possibly have observable consequences. This type of thinking uh, really took off with the work by Bose et al. and uh, Marletto and Vedral, who showed that in principle, we can design experiments which lead to a gravity induced entanglement and, and in which are feasible with near uh, technology. They made the claim that this experiment would reveal whether gravity is fundamentally quantum or not. And we recently came back to this issue and showed that another, me and Baylock, and we showed that there is another phenomenon uh, that can be the gravity induced rabi oscillations are also possible in such systems. Now, let me give you just a picture from this work. It's just Imagine two one-dimensional, uh, two one-dimensional uh, double well potentials, and, and and you have a cut state on its potential, and you have this geometry. You can choose other geometries, and you can easily show that this type of system leads to Rabi oscillations, if uh, <coughs> with the with this type of frequency which is in principle measurable for 10 to the 10th atomic mass units. 
So you need a really macroscopic quantum system in the superposition. And our statement is that the foundational question that can be settled by this class of experiments is whether the gravitational force remains slave to the mass density. Now, of course, Bose, Tal, Mandelet, and Vedral have claimed that you can see quantum gravity or quantum effects in gravity. We disagree with that claim. There is a very lively discussion, many references, and I think it's a very interesting topic to follow, whether you are in the uh, gravitational quantum physics or in the quantum gravity community. Here is a very partial list of references of this discussion. And this work is, we want to go a little bit further than this debate. Rather, we want to say, okay, let's start from quantum gravity, from an actual theory of quantum gravity. If we, uh, if we take the weak, gravity, the weak gravity limit, then this quantum gravity theory is workable. It's not like the full quantum gravity, but it's still general relativity linearized. What we say, linearized quantum geometry dynamics. Now, this might be appear as an overkill, you know, to start with full quantum geometry dynamics, even linearized, if we, for just with gravity Newtonian limit. But, well, I, I think it is not. What comes out is that an infamous pro problem in quantum gravity, the problem of time, also appears when we go at weak gravity and Newtonian limit. And it's, it creates a problem in, make, in constructing a predictive theory, a predictive space-time theory. So let's see. Now, they, but the most the textbook way to linearize is to start to do the linearizers even from the Lagrangian. And if you want to quantize, canonically quantize, then you have to take the Hamiltonian, uh, you do, do the Lesant transform from the linearized Lagrangian. I'm not going to follow this route here. We're going to do more precisely in a way that preserves the symmetries of the Hamiltonian. The result. This way, we have a much better control of what is gauge fixing and what is not gauge fixing. So we start with Hamiltonian general relativity. We linearize at the uh, gravity at the Hamiltonian level, and then we quantize, and then we take the Newtonian limit. The two, the last two steps are interchangeable. So what is Hamiltonian general relativity? Essentially, the observables is the three geometry and its conjugate momentum, and also quantum fields, well, classical fields here, and, class, and their conjugate momentum. So H is a three metric, and pi is its conjugate variable. And it is what we call a parametrized system in the sense that the Hamiltonian is a sum of two constraints. So the Hamiltonian vanishes because the constraint function vanishes. So this is full general relativity, but we take a linearization. The naive way to linearize, let's say, which involves a bit of cheating in the sense that we gauge fix without calling, saying the word, is to expand the metric, expand the momentum, and also expand these parameters, these gates, these laps and shifters, they are called. These laps and shift, uh, are pairs Lagrange multipliers in the action. They are components of the metric that are non-dynamical, actually. So if we do the perturbation theory, we can find the Hamiltonian. The technical form is, is not, the calculation are straightforward. And we, what happens is that they are this, because we partially gauge fix, the Hamiltonian is not more, uh, a, that does not vanish anymore. We have two constraints. And now we split the metric perturbation into three parts. This is well known uh, from gravitational waves. I mean, it's, sorry, uh, I lost it. Yes, it's a three by three matrix. So it has a longitudinal part, a transverse traceless part, and a trace part. So if we split into three components, we see that the in the weak gravity limit, the, Trace part gives you 
essentially a Poisson equation and the conjugate momentum of the longitudinal part is the other constraint. Now, the conjugate momentum, what happens is that the conjugate momentum of phi has a behavior that allows us to interpret it as a time coordinate. And the, and the longitudinal part of the metric has a behavior with respect to the constraints that allows us to interpret it as position coordinates. So I'm just saying, stating that this appears from the analysis how they transform under the constraints. And Arnwood, Desert, and Missner, in the canonical analysis of general relativity, they propose the standard gauge. And uh, to, to work is to take this function tau, which is the conjugate momentum, as you can see, of the gravitational potential to, to take it as the time parameter and have the uh, parameters chi vanish. So this is the so-called ADM gauge, which simplifies extremely all calculations. What happens is that uh, in the ADM gauge, <clears throat> the Hamiltonian simplifies it very much. It's essentially gravitational wave Hamiltonian, which we do not care in the Newtonian regime, and a part which is the self-interaction. Now, this self-interaction contains some terms that are important at the relativistic regime, but when we go to the Newtonian regime, it's unimportant. So, ADM gauge is a standard gauge. It simplifies things very much. All, most calculations, that are doing Hamiltonian and try to go to weak gravity, use ADM gauge or a couple of similar gauges. Now, the method above cheats. As I said, it involves a partial gauge fixing. Now, if we want to do it properly, we, need, we should not linearize the Lagrange multipliers. We should not expand on the Lagrange multipliers. Just keep uh, expand the constraints to second order of the perturbative parameter. This was pointed out by Karel Kuhas a long time ago for, free, for, for uh, pure gravity without matter. Apparently, these calculations have not been done without, with matter so far. And uh, in this case, the constraints become linear with respect to the conjugate momentum of the time, let's say, variable and the position variable. So now systems with, uh, of this form, with constraints of this form, and the, sorry, and the total Hamiltonian values are called parameterized. Parameterized systems are very important in the discussions of quantum gravity and quanti discussion of quantization, essentially because they correspond to an action, even a, Minkowski, a field in Minkowski space-time, if you take the space-time coordinates and make them as dynamical variables, then you obtain a parametrized system with constraints of this form. Now, full general relativity is not of this form. It was a great uh, aim of Karel Kuhas and some collaborators to find the canonical transformation that brings it to, into this form. I don't, they succeeded only in very special systems, but weak gravity is parametrized system, even in presence of matter. Oh, Harris, this is the informal five minute warning for whatever's worth. Oh, five minutes. Okay, let me rush then. Uh, so, parametric you systems. Can, you can bite into the question time too. Okay. So, uh, having a parametric system means essentially that if we set, set tau and chi to any functions of time, of position and momentum, uh, which is sort of position and t, of course, space time coordinates, we have a different gauge fixing. So, we have a controlled way of taking gauge fixing. That's the idea. So we can choose of any, we can consider any coordinate system we want. In the Newtonian gravity, the quantities simplify a lot. And in the ADM gauge, you recover what you would get from uh, Newtonian gravity. No surprise here, but this happens only in the ADM gauge. Now, in principle, we can do all the work in the ADM gauge, if we start from, uh, from, from full gear, we can formulate any theory that works in, in, to this, in order to describe 
a gravitational effects in microscopic quantum system with the Newton energy. Everything can be well defined, but more than, and it's very clear that there are no gravitational degrees of true gravitational degrees of freedom at this level. We know that, but and it, it, it's a trivial consequence of counting the degrees of freedom. The only true degrees of freedom at this level are matter degrees of freedom. So again, we emphasize the result. There is no quantized degrees of freedom involved in gravity generated, for example, uh, entanglement. Now, what is interesting, we can also define proper time observables. So if we have a space-time path in a macroscopic quantum system, we have a, a proper time observable for this quantity. We can also define even which, define operator for light cone fluctuations. The problem is that all these predictions, once we go away from the simple Hamiltonian description and start thinking in terms of space-time, all these predictions are gauge dependent. Why? It's easy to see. Uh, there is one particular gauge, the so-called isotropic gauge, which is related to the ADM gauge. I remind you, the ADM gauge is the one that recovers the standard and uh, Newtonian description. And the difference depends on momentum density and energy density. But in a quantum system, momentum density and energy density are operators. They have hats. You can have superposition of them. So this makes no sense in a QFT, because in the QFT from our starting point, coordinates are C numbers, and here these quantities are operators. So changes of gates make no sense. We can easily show that because of this, that quantum observables are not unitarily equivalent in different gates. So the space-time picture is lost. This problem was noticed early by, by Arno with Desert and Mistner, but now, as I said, we, need, we want to have a quantum theory that originates from general relativity in order to describe these effects. Uh, so, we learn something from this analysis. We should not trust any space-time picture if our, for quantum gravitating system, your starting point is Newtonian gravity. It's ambiguous. At the more fundamental level, even if the gravity is weak, the symmetries of GR are still there. We, we need to describe them in a quantum system. So I'm going to rush about the possibility of describing them with direct quantization, which may, may or may not work. It's work in progress anyway. And I'm going towards then the main challenge. Can we find a quantum description of weak gravity that one respects general covariance? has a consistent and unique space-time picture. This is important. And is predictable for all experiments involving gravitating macroscopic quantum systems. This is a challenge. So we, we are trying with the Dirac quantization. We don't think it was going to work, but we have to finish this up. Our best bet is the history of the formulation of canonical gravity by one of us. Uh, which admits a quantum representation of space-time diffeomorphisms, but it's a challenge. So it's a challenge for quantum gravity researchers to, in order to describe consistently what these experiments that are designed are going to show. Now, if the challenge fails, and I am telling you there are still things to try, but suppose the challenge fails, then Penrose is right. Penrose pointed out in 96 that this is a fundamental ambiguity between gravity and quantum theory, which in our case is the dependence of the results on gauge fixing. In Dirac quantization, it takes a different form, but this ambiguity seems to appear. So unless we solve this problem, I we would have to say that Penrose is right here. Penrose proposed as a solution quantum state reduction induced by gravity. And his estimate uh, was that the effect is of the order of the gravitational self energy of the quantum system. And this was in agreement with the collapse model for gravity induced collapse. So we, we are now talking about the Penrose model, which is widely tested. 
But our analysis here shows that this ambiguity has nothing to do with gravitational self-energy. It has to do with other terms that appear in the three plus one in the Hamiltonian analysis. Terms that depends on the pure gauge uh, quantities. So if we take Penrose, uh, if we take Penrose analysis seriously, then we would have completely new models with very different terms causing the coherence. One more point and I'm going to finish. Let me clarify because this is something that is often discussed in the context uh, of gravity induced decoherence. The gravitational self interaction term is, is a prediction of general relativity. It's fully causality and locality. It appears non local because energy in a constraint, the Hamiltonian in a constraint system, is in a sense, in quotation mark, non local because of the presence of the constraints. Constraints are instantaneous laws that must be satisfied by the initial date. Classically. Quantum mechanically, it depends on how, if you want to implement them properly without gauge fixing, then your observables must commute, for example, with a constraint operator in direct quantization, or your observables must be gauge invariant by construction in reduced space time quantization. This creates many difficulties in what we mean by local. So the notion of locality as we have in quantum information is challenged by if, if you take the constraints of general relativity seriously. I cannot say more, much more about this at the moment, but if we want really to have a quantum information analysis of this class of experiments, then we need to think more about quantities that we will be using. So to conclude, uh, it is necessary to start from first principles in order to discuss about the, gra the gravitation of quantum systems, macroscopic quantum systems. So we may not find a unique answer, but at least we, know, we may know what is the minimum risk answer, the most conservative answer, and then start building from there. Penrose type ambiguities are generic unless we find a really covariant way to for quantum theory. So the problem of time does not go away because gravity is weak. It's a structural problem, whether it's in the structure st is still there at weak gravity. And hopefully, if we can, what, whether we get a genuine space-time description for the quantum systems, or if we don't get it, and we have to assume with Penrose that the coherence is necessary, we, we will probably have new predictions about quantum experiments at weak gravity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Harris. Thank you on behalf of all the muted people. All right, so we open the floor for questions now. If you have any questions, please raise your hands. I think right now you are allowed even to mute yourselves, so you can even do it. Okay, there are two questions that appear simultaneously. Okay, I'm gonna, <laughs> at least on my screen. So I'm gonna start with Albert Roda. Albert? Yep. Thank you. Uh, interesting talk, Harris. So I, I, I appreciate very much what you're saying. I mean, in a sense, uh, I fully agree. That sometimes I would view it in a slightly more covariant formulation instead mm -hmm. of the canonical one you were using, but it's the idea that even when you do just perturbative gravity around the Minkowski background, for example, mm -hmm. um, Maybe the way I would formulate it, which is pretty much equivalent, I think, to what, what you've been arguing, not just the problem of time, but in the more covariant formulation is the mm -hmm. problem of diffeomorphism invariant observables. So observables in quantum gravity, even in the perturbative quantum gravity around uh, linearized perturbative quantum mm -hmm. gravity around flat space that you are considering here, defining proper observables, namely diffeomorphism invariant observables is a highly non-trivial problem. And you know there are all these studies and discussions of the fact, for example, that you can, such observables in general don't exist. Uh, they cannot be local. You cannot have local observables in that context. In, in quantum gravity, even perturbative one, the simplest one you can consider uh, that you-, you, right. you yeah. So in a sense, I mean, it's very similar to what you're just 
presenting you what you're saying. It's maybe, you know, just formulated sometimes in a slightly different way. The highly non-trivial problem of observables in quantum gravity in general, um, even at these simple levels of linearized perturbative quantum gravity, you need them to be diffeomorphism invariant. And that is very difficult. In I mean, you can define some either fully global observables, or if you have asymptotically flat space times, then you have scattering amplitudes, for example, those can be formulated. Uh, in a diffeomorphism invariant manner, but uh, in general, it's uh, and trying to construct not local but even approximately local observables which are diffeomorphism invariant is is is, is really a highly non-trivial uh, problem mm -hmm. in quantum gravity, even at the at the perturbative level. So, um, I mean, I, I fully agree, and I, I'm not sure whether you also agree that this is maybe a slightly different way of formulating, more in the covariant or Lagrangian version approach, so to speak. But I, I pretty much equivalent to most of what you were presenting here. Right? Yes. Well, we prefer to use the Hamiltonian because we want to connect, you know, with the Hilbert space language, uh, talk about multipartite systems if necessary, and so on. But yes, the Lagrangian level is also challenging. Yeah. Right. All right. So next person is a uh, uh, Rob man, Rob. Yeah, hi. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Karis, for your talk. Uh, quite interesting. I guess I'm wondering, uh, at a pragmatic level, how did some of... Oh, oh. Rob, are you there? So I think at the pragmatic level, uh, Rob has lost uh, connection, <laughs> very likely. C can you hear me? Oh, now we can. There you go. I guess. Right, okay, sorry. Uh, thanks, uh, Karis, for the talk. Um, I was wondering about the, well, about more of the pragmatic implications of this, especially the first statement, because we have experiments like the uh, COW experiment mm -hmm. and Nez Vyshevsky's experiments about neutrons in a right, gravitational yes. field. So those are certainly quantum systems that gravitate uh, and we don't seem to need to worry about these things. So right. how do I yes. understand that? So you need quantum systems that, well, these are described at the level, let's say of QFT in Kert space time. The background is fixed, both examples. So, so now we're talking about example, for example, two cut states, two massive cut states interacting. So we need to have the, full interaction between two, the two bodies, full quantum interaction between the two bodies that generate gravity. So if one body is very heavy and you can take, you can treat it essentially as a classical background field, you don't need to worry. You, you just use QFT in Kerr space time. So background. this only matters if I have something like gravitational, I have, I, have, I have cat states that are gravitationally attracting each other or something. Right, so, yes. Okay. Or if, if you have gravity, or if you have gravitons, for example, gravit well, quantized gravitational waves where the quantum nature is very strong, like if they're highly squeezed, for example. Yeah, okay. All right, wonderful. Are there any more questions? All right, if not, uh, let's thank Haris Anastopoulos again. Haris, thank you so much for the talk. And I think with this, we end uh, today's session. Now, thank you very much for indulging my uh, chairing of it. <laughs> it was, uh, it's actually very nice to really have discussions with people uh, in these times uh, outside of your local, your local clusters, I guess. But uh, uh, honestly, I think this is uh, a really, really good format for the conference that hopefully we can keep like that. Um, one more thing before we leave, uh, remember that there is no uh, Australian session this evening, or well, evening from the point of view of Waterloo, of course, and uh, that we will also do two things this week, very soon. One of them is send an email to everybody with the link for the uh, recorded sessions. And uh, the second is uh, sending the calendar as well for next month. We are a little bit behind on that, but we will have it at the very latest on the weekend. So keep an eye on your emails and I uh, hope I'll see you, all of you uh, next Wednesday. So thank you very much. That's the end of the session. Thank you. <laughs>